On June 30, 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville and Gustave de Beaumont arrived in Yonkers, New York, following a visit to New York City, where they got their early impressions of American democracy. This Monday, June 30th, our Tocqueville tour continues, 166 years later, as we go live with the C-SPAN school bus in Yonkers and learn more about the beginnings of Tocqueville and Beaumont's trek to upstate New York and the American frontier. Twenty-five years after the Watergate break-in, all next week, C-SPAN airs a series of panel discussions with key figures from the Watergate era, including John Dean, Carl Bernstein, Ben Bradley, and Howard Baker. You'll also see archival footage of the Watergate hearings, and we want to hear from you through your phone calls, faxes, and email. The Watergate 25th Anniversary Series, June 30th through July 4th, at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific. Now from Capitol Hill, a hearing on Gulf War illnesses. Today, the House Human Resources Subcommittee looked at a General Accounting Office report on medical research programs related to Gulf War veterans. This two-and-a-half-hour hearing is chaired by Connecticut Congressman Christopher Shays. Call this, hear call this hearing to order and first apologize to my colleagues. It's my practice to start the hearings on time, and I was at the Budget Committee giving uh, the two reconciliation bills to the committee on behalf of Mr. Kasich, and I was not allowed to leave by the committee. <laughs> so I'm a little late, and I apologize. I did want the committee to wait because I consider this an extraordinary hearing today, and I uh, wanted to participate in all of it. In March of 1996, we began these hearings on Gulf War illnesses because many veterans were telling us the federal response to their plight was blind and passive. They found the research unfocused, their diagnosis skewed towards stress, and their treatments inconsistent or ineffective. It became clear to us very quickly our veterans were right on, on all counts. The subcommittee's goal, like theirs, is to see that all Gulf War veterans are properly diagnosed, effectively treated, and fairly compensated. Today, the General Accounting Office, GAO, will discuss their report, Gulf, Gulf War Illnesses, Improved Monitoring of Clinical Pros Progress and Reexamination of Research Emphasis are Needed. Significant findings in this report confirm what sick veterans, physicians, research scientists and others have been telling this subcommittee consistently over the course of eight previous hearings. This GAO report, much of our earlier testimony, and more we, we will hear on Thursday, all speak of an official approach to Gulf War illnesses still, still permeated by diffidence, denial, and a desire to embrace preordained, unsubstantiated conclusions. Sadly, the diffidence, denials, and desire to jump to convenient conclusions continue. The official response to this report by the Department of Veterans Affairs, VA, and the Department of Defense, DOD, betray the same arrogance and myopic, myopia, myopia that blinded them to the obvious probability of low-level chemical warfare agents exposures until just last year when Camasia forced their eyes to open slightly. In response to the findings and recommendations in this report, the VA and DOD attempted to ignore the message and attack the messenger, challenging GAO's methodology and expertise. It is disappointing that the departments took defensive, even petulant, exception to GAO findings and recommendations to improve the quality of health care for Gulf War veterans and refocus the research agenda on treatment. Just as distressing was the position taken on this report by the President's Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans Illnesses, PAC, GAO challenged the PAC's conclusion, conclusion supporting the st stress as a major cause of Gulf War illnesses, minimizing the threat of leishmaniasia, and dismissing the long-term health effects of organ phosphates exposure. DOD and, to a lesser extent, the VA endorsed these conclusions. By entering into a joint defense of, of the status quo with the very departments they are charged by the President to oversee, I fear the PAC may have lost sight of the solution and become part of the problem. When the President's Advisory Committee issued their final report in January, the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Gulf War Illnesses, 
Rear Admiral Paul Busick said the administration's future mission for the PAC was, quote, to address the issue of the process that the Department of Defense is using to get to the answers that we need in terms of investigations into low-level chemicals and those kinds of issues, end of quote. Yet when the GAO, complying with, a, complying with a congressional mandate, reports persistent flaws in that process, quote, are likely to prevent researchers from providing precise, accurate, and conclusive answers regarding the causes of veterans' illnesses, end of quote, the administration's watchdog only growls at the messenger. This report and the telling responses it has evoked add weight to the argument that the riddle of Gulf War veterans' illnesses will never be solved from inside the Pentagon or the VA. Today, on Thursday and the weeks ahead, this subcommittee will discuss how issues affecting the health of Gulf War veterans can be liberated from the constraints of military doctrine and medical bureaucracy and how the Gulf War research agenda might be more effectively controlled by an independent body veterans and others can trust. As in the past, the GAO plays an important role in those discussions, and we welcome their testimony. And at this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Sanders. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and let me just express to you my pride in working with you and my belief that you have taken this whole issue as far as it has gone because you've worked in a nonpartisan way and you've been extraordinarily persistent. So I congratulate you and your staff uh, for all of the work that they have done. Uh, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit a document for the record. Uh, and this document is a letter to the Presidential Advisory Committee dated June 20th, 1997, uh, drafted by my office and signed by 86 members of the Congress. Uh, and in this letter, 86 members of the Congress agree that the Presidential Advisory Committee needs to reassess its conclusion that, quote, current scientific evidence does not support a causal link between Gulf veterans' illnesses and exposures while in the Gulf region to the following environmental risk factors associated by the assessed by the committee. Pesticides, chemical and biological warfare agents, vaccines, pyridostigmine, bromide, infectious diseases, depleted uranium, oil well fires, and smoke and petroleum products. In other words, when I took this letter around to our colleagues, I found very few members who believed that stress and stress alone was the cause of Persian Gulf illness. I think all of us recognize the important role that stress plays, but very few members, and I think very few people in the United States of America believe that stress alone, as the Presidential Advisory Committee has suggested, is the cause of Persian Gulf illness. Uh, while we have not yet received a formal response from the Presidential Advisory Committee, as you indicated in your uh, comments, uh, once again they are defensive and once again uh, they continue to go forward and suggest that anybody who is talking about the role that chemicals have played uh, doesn't understand what they are talking about. Um, I think, uh, let me just give you a uh, a couple of examples of, of the problems that I've had with the Presidential Advisory uh, Committee. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote a letter to the uh, committee uh, because I noticed that, um, interestingly enough, the DOD in 1995 did a study. And you know what their study concluded? Their study concluded that pyridostigmine, bromide, combined with DEET and combined with permethrin has a synergistic effect, much more than the additive effect. When you combine the three, it has a significant effect on lethality. I found it very interesting that in the Presidential Advisory Committee final report, the word significant um, was changed uh, and it became a slight. The word significant went to slight. I found it interesting in reading New York Times articles that when the DOD itself, when the DOD itself had done the right research, New York Times, Wednesday, May 14th, headline, study leaks memory loss to nerve gas as in Gulf. Interestingly enough, the researcher, Dr. Prendergrass, says, I don't think it's too early to draw conclusions, he said in an interview. The type of exposure regime that we employed in the animals and the type of exposures that our troops experience in the Gulf are analogous. And the types of memory deficits that we've seen in the animals and those reported by Gulf War patients are extremely similar. In other words, the DOD researcher says, I think we're making progress. What does the DOD say in response to their own study? 
In a statement today, the Pentagon praised the experiments as important, but the department said, quote, these initial findings require replication in other spe species, including non-human. Um, the Pentagon also questioned whether the experiments in which the rats were injected with the chemicals over a two-week period offered many clues to the health problems of the veterans. Quote, this route of administration and duration of exposure does not parallel any known human exposure to troops. So in other words, you have this irony. The DOD does the research. The guy who does the research says, I think we've made an important finding. And the DOD attempts to minimize what their own research has done. On and on ago, we have had testimony from witnesses here who have told us they were uh, Dr. Tucker. Remember Dr. Tucker? Fired because he had the courage to go outside of the, uh, uh, the parameters established by the PAC. Uh, Dr. Myra Shayovitz, who's a physician who formerly worked at uh, the VA hospital in Northampton, Massachusetts, believed that chemicals played a role. She developed a protocol for uh, treatment, uh, did not get her research funded. Uh, Dr. Claudia Miller, who you have had before this committee, also was in line to receive funding to look at chemicals, did not get uh, funded. Dr. James Moss, after concluding that PB and DEET, when combined, produced toxic effects on cockroaches, was terminated from his employment with the Department of Agriculture. On and on and on it go. When conclusions arise that seem to go beyond the paradigm established by the DOD and the VA, those researchers get the short shrift. I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. I think the time is now to say thank you very much, DOD and VA. You've had your opportunity. You've had the last five years. You haven't done it. I think we've got to go outside the DOD and the VA. I think we need a Manhattan-type project. As I said before, I think the National uh, Institute of Environmental Health Studies might be a good start. They are interested in looking at the role the chemicals have played. Uh, and I also want to conclude simply by congratulating uh, the GAO for their research uh, and, and in, in helping us understand uh, the failures of what the DOD and the VA have uh, done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Before recognizing uh, other members, I would just like to ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place any opening statement in the record mm -hmm. and that the record remain open for three days uh, for that purpose and without objection so ordered. And also ask for the further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. Um, and the information that you uh, requested be put in the record without objection so ordered. And at this time, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, Mr. Snowbarger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the opportunity to place uh, opening statements in the record, I'm anxious to uh, hear what our witnesses have to say today, and I'll pass on an opening statement. I thank the gentleman. Uh, uh, Mr. Kucinich, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I want to thank you uh, again for your persistent efforts in this area, uh, studying the Gulf War syndrome. As I've had the opportunity to be on this committee and to uh, listen to testimony and to hear the uh, chair's appeal for more information, I keep thinking about the uh, men and women who were called to serve this country and who do serve this country and how when they move forward to defend the country, if they become hurt as a result or injured or ill as a result of that defense, then it's the country's responsibility to defend them. And it's very clear from the evidence which has been presented that our country has failed to defend the people who have defended this country. The Department of Defense, in its many years of dealing with this, has become twisted in its approach as it focuses its efforts in protecting American interests against outside enemies when confronted with the serious possibility of its own ineptitude, its own failures, its energies have become twisted and rechanneled to calling our very own troops an enemy. And the insistence of our troops on simple justice somehow becomes an impediment to the working of the Department of Defense. It's unfortunate that those who 
have handled this issue in the Department of Defense have not had the perceptiveness or the concern to uh, determine the true causes of the Persian Gulf Syndrome as uh, uh, this study has done. And you know, Mr. Chairman, as I think about it, you wonder, what does this say about the ability of those who are running the department? Because I don't think we can look at these things as a matter in isolation. Because if we would take something as important as the treatment of our very own soldiers, or in this case, the mistreatment, and use that as a measure of how the department is run, it really raises questions of uh, much larger than the scope of this committee about our nation's defense. I mean, how do we treat our soldiers? How do we treat our veterans? Do they deserve the kind of cover-up which has ensued throughout the history of dealing with this Persian Gulf Syndrome? I'm grateful to be on a committee which has the uh, integrity and the willingness to look into questions that uh, other branches of the government haven't. And I'm uh, looking forward to the presentation of the GAO report. And once again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Shays for his dedication to uh, the American people and to veterans and to those in the service who uh, really rely on you and on this committee for an opportunity to uh, receive some simple justice. Thank you. Thank, thank the gentleman. Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Sorry. Pappas, uh, you would be recognized. Excuse me, Mr. Allen. It's fair. Just <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the folks for being here today. And, and Mr. Chairman, I want to commend you for calling this hearing, which is really the continuation of an effort that you began, I know, prior to my uh, serving in Congress, but certainly have been fortunate to participate in other hearings concerning the Persian Gulf War Syndrome. The recent GAO report that has been issued on the subject is, quite frankly, very disturbing. The notion that both the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs did not do a thorough job in addressing the health concerns of our Gulf War veterans, unfortunately, is not surprising when one considers it took the Pentagon five years to admit that at least 20,000 soldiers were presumed to be exposed to chemical weapons. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in past hearings conducted by this subcommittee, veterans have testified about their difficulty in getting a proper diagnosis and treatment from both the DOD and the VA doctors. Uh, unfortunately, many of them were, uh, it was suggested that they are just suffering from some mental illness. But this report underscores the need to have an independent panel review this evidence and help address the concerns of our nation's veterans. I look forward to hearing the testimony by the GAO today on their study. I hope corrective measures can begin soon to help our veterans who are coping with their illness. We certainly owe it to them. I thank the chairman. I thank the gentleman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Allen, you do now have the floor. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your leadership, uh, that of Mr. Sanders and the other members of this committee, in examining the effectiveness of the federal government, especially departments of defense and veterans affairs, and identifying the causes and the appropriate treatment for the deteriorating health of so many of our veterans who served in Desert Storm. Uh, there are about 697,000 men and women of our armed forces who served in the Persian Gulf, and hundreds of thousands are suffering from a series of debilitating ailments. And it is disheartening and alarming that the federal agencies responsible for their medical care uh, have failed on three fronts, according to this recent GAO report. The GAO found that, the number one, that the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs have failed to determine whether ill veterans have improved or deteriorated since their first diagnostic examination. Second, the current research will not provide precise, accurate, and conclusive answers because of the, for the, the uh, formidable methodological problems. And this research also lacks a, co a precise, uh, focused uh, approach. Third, the President's Committee reached several, several conclusions in its final report without sufficient evidence. It seems clear to me that the Federal Government has failed to, uh, in its efforts to address the cause and treatment of Gulf War illnesses, and renewed efforts must be undertaken to improve the monitoring of clinical progress and to explore new avenues in medical research. I do not underestimate the difficulty of this project. 
because the causation of uh, this, these kinds of illnesses is so much more complex than the kinds of illnesses that most doctors, including military doctors, are trying to deal with on a normal basis. It requires more information, more comprehensive information from a wider variety of sources than is typical. But nevertheless, the fundamental point is we sent our men and women to the Persian Gulf. We have ignored their concerns and their complaints for too long, and it is time to figure out how to set the record straight, how to take care of the veterans who have been suffering, how to figure out what happened, and now what we do about it. And I want to thank uh, those who are here to testify today. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. At this time, uh, we will call our first and only panel. Uh, that's Dr. Hevelin, Director of Planning and Reporting, General Accounting Office, accompanied by Mr. Chan, Director of Special Studies and Evaluation Group, and Dr. Uh, Sharma, uh, Assistant Director of Special Studies and Evaluation Group. All three are at GAO. I'd, I'd invite you to come forward and remain standing until we swear you in. As you know, we swear in all our witnesses, including members of Congress. Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? For the record, all three have responded in the affirmative. Please be seated. And um, I, I extended my apology to the committee for uh, being late, and I, I would like to extend my apology to, uh, to the three of you and to, uh, to our guests as well. Uh, it's, it is uh, good to have you here today, and thank you. Um, doc Dr. Havilland, we're not going to put a clock on your testimony. Uh, this is uh, just uh, one panel, and by the way, we will be having the DOD and the VA come before us on Thursday, so uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about their view of your report. But we want you to, uh, to give your testimony, uh, maybe not in, in, uh, in its entirety, but almost. <laughs> All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I will submit the full statement for the record, and I will summarize some, somewhat, skip a few of the areas like background. In our work, which we released yesterday, uh, which was mandated by the 1997 National Defense Authorization Act, we addressed three issues. Uh, the first issue was, uh, the DOD and VA provisions for following up on the illnesses of the Gulf War veterans. Uh, the second, we looked into the coherence of the government's research strategy. And the third issue we looked at was the consistency of key official conclusions uh, with the available data on the causes of the Gulf veterans' illnesses. Uh, I'd like to summarize our conclusions about those uh, three issues and then provide a little more detail. Uh, first, regarding the first issue, uh, DOD and VA uh, has uh, made no provisions to follow up on the condition of the Gulf War veterans. Uh, we found neither DOD nor VA have any means of knowing whether the Gulf War veterans who are ill are better or worse off than they were when they were first examined. As to the second issue, uh, which is the coherence of the government's research strategy, uh, we believe that the federal research has not been pursued proactively. Uh, although health problems surfaced in the early 1990s, uh, the vast majority of uh, the research was only started in 1994 or later, and some will not be completed until the year 2000 or beyond. Uh, about 80 percent of it is still ongoing. Uh, the majority of the research, uh, close to one half, is focused on descriptive epidemiological studies uh, as a prevalence of cause. Little of the research is looking into effective treatments. Uh, the epidemiological research is uh, to determine the nature and cause of a particular illness, and the objective is to develop clues uh, as to the treatment through building hypotheses and refining them and proving them. An example where this worked really well was uh, research that was done into cholesterol, uh, which the researchers were able to relate uh, 
higher blood levels of cholesterol to heart disease. And from there, they went on uh, to develop hypothesis and treatment for uh, people who had high cholesterol so that their uh, susceptibility to heart disease would be lower in the future. Uh, the problem, uh, when we look at the epidemiological research that's going on with the Gulf War veterans, is that there are scanty records on who was exposed to what, when, or on the vaccines or doses of drugs that, and amounts that were given to individual veterans. And their memories are uh, unreliable, or they may not have known what they were exposed to at the time that they were exposed. Uh, consequently, it's quite likely that many of the epidemiological studies uh, will produce results that are inaccurate or difficult to interpret when they're finished. Another large number of the studies, about a third of them, are pursuing the hypothesis that stress is a major contributing factor to the illnesses. Uh, we didn't find this research supportive of the Presidential Advisory Committee's conclusion that stress is a major contributing factor to the range of symptoms the veterans are reporting. And some hypotheses, such as uh, symptoms are due to exposure to pesticides and chemicals used in the Gulf War, were initially funded only with private funds. Uh, the bottom line is that not much of the research as currently being carried out uh, is going to result in answers on how best to treat these illnesses. And it is likely, uh, it's unlikely to reveal the causes of the illnesses when the research is finished. Our third issue drew the most controversy. Uh, we found the support for some official conclusions regarding stress, uh, leishmaniasis, and exposure to chemical agents was weak or subject to alternative conclusions. Uh, we believe you should not close the doors prematurely to causes without evidence. Uh, six years after the war, we know little about the causes of the illnesses conclusively. Uh, the link between stress and the veteran's physical symptoms is not well established. Uh, the pre prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, may be overestimated. Leishmaniasis needs to continue to be considered as a possible future risk since it can lie dormant for up to 20 years. And there is substantial evidence that organophosphate compounds, which were in pesticides used during the war and in chemical nerve agents Iraq possessed, might be associated with delayed or long-term health effects. A number of the veterans were evidently exposed to chemical fallouts, and although we have no evidence that they used it, Iraq had weaponized the biological agent aflatoxin, whose health effects appear years after exposure. Uh, generally in the form of liver cancer. Um, I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the methodology we used in doing our, our uh, research. Uh, to address the first evaluation question, uh, whether DOD and VA had a way of following up and knowing whether the veterans were in uh, better health now or worse health than they were when they were first examined, uh, we reviewed the literature, agency documents, conducted structured interviews with DOD and VA officials. Uh, we asked them questions uh, designed to identify and contrast their methods for monitoring the quality and outcomes of treatment and diagnostic programs and the health of the registered veterans. Uh, for our second objective, uh, which concerns the coherence of the research strategy of the government, uh, to answer this question, we conducted a systematic review of pertinent literature and agency documents and reports. Uh, we also interviewed um, representatives of the Persian Gulf Veterans Coordinating Board, Research Working Group, and officials of VA, DOD, and the Central Intelligence Agency. We surveyed primary investigators, uh, over 70 percent of them, uh, who were doing, conducting the epidemiological studies. And because of different methodology standards uh, apply to various types of research, and because of the overwhelming majority of federally sponsored research is categorized as epidemiological, we limit our survey to those responsible for those studies. Uh, with the help of an expert epidemiological 
consultant, we devised a questionnaire uh, which assessed critical elements of those studies, including, including quality of exposure measurement, uh, specificity of the case definition, steps to ensure adequate sample size, and to identify specific problems that the primary investigators may have encountered in implementing their studies. We also reviewed and categorized descriptions of all 91 projects which were identified by April 1997 and uh, based on their apparent focus and primary objective. And finally, to review the progress of the major ongoing research efforts, we visited Walter Reed Army Institute of Research, the Navy Health Research Center, and two of VA's Environmental Hazards Research Centers. On the third objective, we reviewed the major conclusions of the PGVCB and the Presidential Advisory Committee uh, to determine the strength of evidence supporting their major conclusions. Uh, the purpose of this review was not to critique their efforts, per se, uh, but rather describe the amount of knowledge about the illnesses that has been generated by research six years after the war. Uh, we reviewed these conclusions because they are the strongest statements that we found uh, on, the on these matters by any official body. The Presidential Advisory Committee's report was significant uh, because the panel included a number of recognized esper experts, was assisted by a large staff of scientists and attorneys, and in addition, they conducted an extensive review of the, lit of the research. Um, thus, we believe that evaluating those conclusions uh, would provide important evidence about how fruitful the federal research had been thus far. Uh, we reviewed uh, scientific literature and we consulted experts in the field of epidemiology, uh, toxicology, and medicine. Uh, to ensure that the staff conducting the work had the appropriate backgrounds in this field, uh, we uh, put on to this job, we uh, staffed this job uh, with staff who had expertise in epidemiology, psychology, environmental health, toxicology, engineering, weapons design, program evaluation, and methodology. And in, and in addition, using the process we have to bring in experts uh, that we don't uh, have assigned full-time on a job, but whose expertise we can use when needed in conducting our research. Uh, we included experts um, from our organization uh, who have expertise in chemical and biological warfare and military health systems. Uh, we also had medical experts review our work and we had extensive discussions with experts in academia uh, in each of the substantive uh, fields relevant to the issue. And finally, we talked to a number of authors in the studies we cited in the report to ensure that we had uh, correctly interpreted their findings and we had independent experts review our draft report. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we were in compliance with all of the general uh, practices and policies that we have inside of GAO uh, to assure that we have quality insurance in doing our work. Um, I will um, now uh, spend some time uh, talking about the fact that DOD and VA uh, have no systematic approach to monitoring the Gulf War veterans' health after the initial examination. Uh, over 100,000 of about the 700,000 Gulf War veterans have participated in uh, the VA and DOD examination programs. Uh, nearly. 90% have reported a wide array of health complaints and disabling conditions. Uh, most commonly reported symptoms are fatigue, muscle and joint pain, uh, gastrointestinal complaints, headache, skin rash, depression, neurological and neurocognitive impairments, memory loss, shortness of breath, and sleep disturbances. Um, uh, officials in both DOD and VA claim that regardless of the illnesses, the veterans are receiving the appropriate treatment. Uh, both agencies have tried to measure and ensure the quality of their initial examinations through standards such as training that is given to medical physicians and the standards for physician qualification. Uh, however, 
These mechanisms don't ensure a given level of effectiveness for the care that's provided or permit identification of the most effective treatments. Uh, we found they had no monitoring mechanisms for uh, determining the quality, the appropriateness, or the effectiveness of the care that they're getting after the initial examinations. We believe such monitoring is important because undiagnosed conditions are not uncommon among the ill veterans and treatment for the veterans with undiagnosed conditions is based on their symptoms and veterans with undiagnosed conditions or multiple diagnoses may be seeing multiple providers. And without the follow-up, uh, we cannot say whether these ill veterans are any better or worse today than they were when they were first examined. Uh, the second issue, uh, we'll spend a little time now going, uh, delving a little deeper into the second issue, which is uh, that the federal research strategy lacks a coherent approach. Uh, as I said earlier, we do not believe that uh, the illness and the factors uh, that might have caused the pro problems have been pursued proactively, uh, and although uh, the health problems began surfacing in the 1990s. The vast majority of the research was not initiated until 1994 or later. Um, although uh, many of this, we have about 91 studies ongoing, um, over four-fifths of them are not yet complete, and the results uh, will not be available until the year 2000. Uh, we found that some of the hypotheses received early emphasis while some hypotheses were not initially pursued. Uh, the research on exposure to stress received early emphasis. And research such as research on low-level chemical exposure was not pursued until it was legislated in 1966. Uh, the failure to fund some research cannot be traced to the absence of investigator-initiated submissions. Uh, there were just proposals. For, just for the record, it's 1996? 96, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Yes. Mm. I misspoke. <clears throat> According to the DOD officials, three recently funded proposals on low-level chemical exposure had pre previously been denied funds. And we found that additional hypotheses were pursued in the private sector. A substantial body of research suggests that low-level exposure to chemical warfare agents or chemically related compounds such as pesticides is associated with delayed or long-term health effects. Regarding the delayed health effects on organophosphates, the chemical family that's used in many uh, pesticides and chemical warfare agents, uh, there is evidence from animal experiments, studies of accidental human exposures, and epidemiological studies of humans at low-level exposures uh, to certain of these compounds, including sarin nerve agents, uh, to which some of the troops may have been exposed can cause delayed chronic neurotoxic effects. Uh, it has been suggested that the ill-defined symptoms experienced by the veterans may do, be due in part to organic phosphate-induced delayed neurotoxicity. Uh, this hypothesis was tested in a privately supported study. Uh, in addition to clarifying the patterns among veterans' symptoms by using statistical factor analysis, the study demonstrated that vague symptoms of the ill veterans are associated with objective brain and nerve damage compatible with the known chronic effects of exposure to low levels of organic phosphates. And it further linked uh, their illnesses to exposure of to a combination of chemicals, including nerve agents, pesticides and flea collars, uh, DEET, uh, which is a roll-on uh, insect repellent, and uh, PB tablets. Toxicological research indicates that PB, which uh, the Gulf veterans took to protect, protect themselves against the immediate life-threatening effects of nerve, nerve agents, may alter the metabolism of organophosphates in ways that activate delayed chronic effects of the brain. Uh, moreover, exposure to combinations of these chemicals uh, have shown in animal, in animal studies to be far more likely to cause morbidity and mortality than any of the chemicals acting alone. Uh, we found that the bulk of the ongoing research in 
uh, the illnesses focuses on the epidemiological study of the uh, of prevalence and the cause of the illnesses. Um, I discussed that earlier, so I will um, move on into uh, some of the things that we uh, have noted is challenges to uh, the researchers who are conducting uh, these studies. Uh, first, uh, as I said, they found it difficult to uh, it gather information about exposures such as things like oil well fire smoke and insects carrying infection. Uh, DOD has acknowledged that the records of the use of PB and vaccinations to protect against chemical and biological warfare exposures were inadequate. Uh, there is uh, research going on right now to try to find the majority of the records which uh, seem to be uh, missing. Gulf War veterans were typically exposed to a wide array of agents and it's difficult to isolate and characterize the effects of the individual agents or to study their combined effects. Uh, most of the studies on the Gulf War veterans illnesses have relied only on self-reports for measuring most of the agents to which they have been exposed. And it is difficult at years after the war uh, to be accurate and not to be biased about the recollection of what, in fact, they were exposed to during the time that they were uh, over in the Gulf. As a result, the finding from these studies may be spurious or equivocal. Classifying the symptoms and identifying illnesses of Gulf War veterans has been difficult. Uh, from the onset, symptoms reported by the veterans have been varied and difficult to classify in one or more distinct illnesses. Uh, moreover, several different diagnoses may provide plausible explanations for some of the specific health complaints. It has thus been difficult to develop a case definition that is a reliable way to identify individuals with a specific disease. Uh, and this is a criterion for doing effective epidemiological research. Uh, in summary, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, the ongoing epidemiological research will not be able to provide precise, accurate, and conclusive answers regarding the causes of the illnesses uh, because of these formidable methodological problems. Uh, move now to our last area of investigation, which was uh, the support for key government conclusions, uh, which we found to be weak and subject to alternative uh, interpretations. Uh, as I had mentioned, uh, we looked at the conclusions drawn by the Presidential Advisory Committee because this are uh, the major uh, statement, printed statement about the Gulf War illness and the research uh, that was being endorsed. Uh, DOD endorsed the committee's conclusions about the likelihood that exposure to 10 commonly cited agents contributed to the explained and unexplained illnesses of the veterans. Uh, we found the evidence to support three of these conclusions, either weak or subject to alternative interpretations. Uh, and I'll discuss those now. First, the committee concluded that stress is likely to be an, an important contributing factor to the broad range of illnesses currently being reported by the Gulf War veterans. Well, while stress can induce physical illness, uh, the link between stress and these veterans' physical symptoms has not been firmly established. Uh, for example, a large-scale, federally funded study concluded that for those veterans who deployed to the Gulf War and currently reported physical symptoms, neither stress nor exposure to combat or its aftermath bear much rela relationship to their distress. Uh, the committee stated that epidemiological studies to assess the effects of stress in variably found higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder in Gulf War veterans than among individuals in non-deployed units or in the general U.S. population of the same age. Our review indicated that the prevalence of PTSD among the veterans may be overestimated due to problems in the methods they use to identify it. Uh, specifically, uh, these studies to which the committee refers have not excluded other conditions uh, such as neurological disorders that produce symp symptoms similar to PTSD and can also elevate scores on the key measures of the PTSD. 
Uh, also, the use of broad heterogeneous groups of diagnoses um, in data from DOD's clinical program may contribute to overestimation of the extent of the serious psychological illnesses among, among the Gulf War veterans. Second, the committee concluded that it's unlikely that infectious diseases endemic to the Gulf region are responsible for long-term health effects on the Gulf War veterans, except in a small number of known individuals. Uh, similarly, uh, the PGVCB concluded that because of the small number of reported cases, the likelihood of Leishmania tropica is as an important risk factor for widely reported illnesses has diminished. Uh, while this is the case for observed symptomatic infection with the parasite, the prevalence of asymptomatic infection is unknown, and such infection, infection may reemerge in cases in which the patient's immune system becomes a de uh, deficient sometime in the future. As the committee noted, the infection may lie dormant uh, up to 20 years in uh, the uh, human system. And because of this long latency, the infected population is a hidden population. And because in, even in classic forms of leishmaniasis, it's difficult to recognize. And we believe that it should be retained as a potential risk factor for individuals who suffer from immune deficiency. Third, the committee concluded that it's unlikely that the health effects uh, reported by many of the veterans were the result of biological or chemical warfare agents, depleted uranium, oil welfare, well, fire smoke, pesticides, petroleum products, and PB or vaccines. However, our review of the conclusions indicated that while the committee found no evidence that biological weapons were deployed during the war, the United States lacked the capacity to promptly detect biological agents, and the effects of one agent, aflatoxin, would not be observed for many years. Uh, and this agent was weaponized by the Iraqs. Evidence from various sources indicates that chemical agents were pres present at Kamasia, Iraq, and elsewhere on the battlefield. Uh, the ma magnitude of the exposure to chemical agents has not been fully rec resolved. And as we recently reported, 16 of the 21 sites categorized by the Gulf War planners as nuclear, biological, and chemical facilities were destroyed. However, the United Nations Special Commission found after the war that not all the possible NBC targets had been identified by U.S. planners. Uh, the Commission has investigated a large number of the facilities suspected by the U.S. authorities as being NBC-related. And regarding those the Commission has not yet inspected, we determined that each was attacked by coalition Air Force aircraft during the Gulf War. And one of these sites is located within the Kuwait Theater of Operation in close proximity to the border where coalition ground forces were located. Also, exposure to certain pesticides can induce a delayed neurological condition without causing immediate symptoms. And available research indicates that exposure to PB can alter the metabolism of organophosphates. This is the chemical family uh, of some of the pesticides that were used in the Gulf War, as well as certain chemical warfare agents. Uh, the all, metabolism can be altered in ways that enhance chronic effects of the brain. Uh, in our uh, report, we have three recommendations coming from uh, the work that I have just described. Uh, first, uh, because of the number of Gulf War veterans who continue to ex experience illnesses and that maybe these illnesses may be related to their service during the war, we recommended that the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Veterans Affairs set up a plan for monitoring their clinical progress uh, so that we can help promote effective treatment, uh, better direct the research agenda, and uh, that we can give, we also recommend that give greater priority to research on effective treatment for the ill veterans and on low level exposures to chemicals and their interactive effects and less priority to further epidemiological studies. We also recommended uh, that the Secretaries of Defense and Veterans Affairs refine the current approaches 
of the clinical and research programs for diagnosing PSD, BSDT, uh, consistent with suggestions recently made by the Institute of Medicine. Uh, the Institute noted that the need uh, for improved documentation of screening procedures and patient histories, including their occupational and experimental, uh, their environmental exposures, and the importance of ruling out alternative causes of impairment was needed. Um, Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks. I'll be uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Sh Sharma and Mr. Chan will be happy to help me answer questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. I, um, I'm struck by the fact that you broke a basic rule of, of investigators that are trying to get at the truth. Uh, in this sense, um, uh, an individual who is investigating political corruption in the community and determined there were about 250 people who had been corrupted by the process of civil service getting promotion, buying their way. He said he succeeded in the end because in the end what he did is he just went after one at a time and the others hid behind the rocks and then he tipped at that rock and finally they realized that he was going after all of them. Uh, but by then it was too late. You have uh, had a very um, clear criticism of not just the VA but the DOD and the President's Advisory Commission on Gulf War Illnesses. Uh, I don't think you have many friends left in that community. Um, and um, I'm concerned about it, frankly. Um, but I congratulate you for your courage. And um, I know that your report will be thoroughly uh, digested by many. Uh, in the end, I think that it will result in some significant pro uh, progress. So I, uh, I really am in awe of your courage, frankly. In your statement on page 18, uh, let me just say one more thing. It is no accident that this committee is the one that has had now our ninth hearing on Gulf War illnesses. And the reason is that we, don't, we oversee the Department of Veterans Affairs for waste, fraud, and abuse. We're not the statutory committee that, <clears throat> that provides legislation. We're not the appropriators. Uh, I have found a tremendous reluctance in Congress on the part of the Armed Services Committee in the House and the Senate to thoroughly examine the DOD and its work uh, because of the relationship that exists between that committee and the DOD. I have found a surprising reluctance on the part of the Veterans Administration Committee to thoroughly examine what the Veterans Administration has done. I found a reluctance on the part of individuals to look at what the CIA has done, and frankly, the advisory committee, a commission as well, the President's Commission. So um, this is a very refreshing opportunity for us to have you look at all three and uh, point out some very, very serious problems with the work of these departments. Now, uh, on page 18, you talk about, actually it begins on 17. You talk about evidence from various sources indicates that chemical agents were present at Kamasi, Iraq, and elsewhere on the battlefield. The magnitude of the exposures to chemical agents has not been fully resolved. As we recently reported, 16 of the 21 sites categorized by Gulf War planets as nuclear, biological, and chemical facilities were destroyed. And then you go on, however, the United Nations Special Commission found after the war that not all the possible uh, NBC targets had been identified by U.S. planners. What do you mean first by that? What do you mean that had not been identified? There are more than 16? Um, there's a, a, a uh, let me try to explain uh, the numbers system here. Yeah. Uh, one is the 21 uh, target uh, that we're talking about, the sites. Uh, those were the sites uh, considered before the war as the NBC targets, and right. I cannot uh, talk about what the, the combination, how many of each. Uh, at the same time... I'm not looking for a breakdown of nuclear, biological, or chemical, right, but right. there were 21 sites before the war But began. in fact, what we did is found out after the war that um, DOD had di identified 34 so-called suspected sites for where chemical weapons could have been either stored 
or a uh, place somewhere. And it's with those uh, 34 sites that we went to uh, the CIA, the DIA, and UN, UNSCOM, to ask uh, how many of these sites had been inspected and what did they find in those sites. It is through that process we found that um, not all the sites had been inspected by the United Nations. Um, you, you don't want to go through that litany of all, all what happened, but... Uh, 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 not yeah. all of the 34 sites? <laughs> right. How and many How many were inspected? Uh, that's... Uh, it initially, uh, CIA told us a number, and... Did not tell you a number? Or? Yes, they did, uh, but then they decided it's a uh, secret classify okay. subsequently. Okay. So I cannot tell you how many were not inspected. All right. Whereupon they identified the sites, and since they obtained the information by UNSCOM, uh, they classified those uninspected sites as secret non fawn That means no foreigners can see it. So as a result, we went and go back to went back to UN and asked them to tell us, and they directed us to the DIA for that set of information. The DIA in turn said, uh, no, you're incorrect. CIA didn't tell you the accurate numbers. In fact, all 34 sites have been inspected. Whereupon they direct us to a specific person in CIA to confirm that fact. And we went back to CIA and CIA sent us through a memo saying that we stand by from our first letter that was sent to you, which was classified. So therefore we left with two sets of information. And whereupon, I sent a letter to the UN asking them, listing all the sites, and say, just check the ones you inspect. <laughs> and they came out with a different set of numbers, which is a little smaller than the CIA, but confirmed, in fact, there were remaining uninspected sites. So what I did is ask our own uh, staff to investigate and look at uh, the data in terms of bombing. Uh, in our own um, study for a different one, we have over one point some odd million pieces of data on every single bomb where it was dropped and when and so on. And we confirmed that those uninspected sites had been bombed by uh, Allied Air Force. So as a result, we said, OK, then uh, why weren't they inspected if they were bombed and they were suspected uh, chemical sites? Uh, whereupon uh, uh, United Nations basically said, uh, you know, the inspection criteria is our own, not of the United States, which uh, we accept. And, um, but in our report to you, to, uh, in this uh, report we issued today, basically, <coughs> We just said that we left that issue open because we really don't know, one, whether there were, in fact, uh, chemical uh, storage in that place. Um, and we were disallowed in telling you where it is because uh, while we were told it's not really classified per se, but uh, in fact, it's highly sensitive uh, for people to know what it is. So, and. That's the language we arrive at uh, in our final report. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I'm just as no, confused. No, no, no. Well, no, but we're not going to be confused by the time we're done here, and maybe okay. not today. I just want, um, I mean, really what you're describing to me is as, as blistering as your report appears to be, uh, you left out a lot of very interesting information that needs okay. to be examined. And, um, uh, what you can say on the record, and we'll sort out the differences and what's secret and what isn't later, that originally we went in thinking there were 21 sites. Uh, we realized during the process of the war there were 34 potential sites, and that right now we do not have a clear picture as to how many of those sites were actually examined after the war. Is that correct? All right, and, and the United mm -hmm. Nations basically agrees that some of those sites were not inspected well, and, by and, them. And yes. let me just say, so not only can we do we not know uh, if all of them were done, we do know that some weren't. Right. And, right. And, yeah, Correct. I mean, that's very, so therein lies the next <coughs> camasia, potentially. Uh, if right. uh, any of them particularly were in the theater of, 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 of the Kuwait battle. 
Now, were any of those sites in Kuwait or in that theater? No, they were not. None of those sites were? In what? Kuwait? Was that your question? Pardon me? They were not in Kuwait. They're not in Kuwait. No, but in the in Kuwait Iraq. theater. Oh, yes. theater operation, yes. Yeah, no, yes. I, yeah. yes. So, in other words, our, our troops went outside of Kuwait, obviously. I care where our troops were. Yes. Where our troops were, I call that the Kuwait theater. Theater operation, yes. The theater of operation, mm -hmm. okay. Were there any of those sites in that theater of operation? Yes. In addition to Camasilla? Yes. Now, in Camasilla, the only reason that was known today was that a veteran actually who was there in the demolition team, because mm -hmm. the difference in some of these sites is that in some of these sites, we bombed them. Correct. And destroyed them that way. So we were kind of a ways from it. Uh, then the question was, which way did the plumes go? And we know they went in some direction, and we're pretty sure they didn't all go in the direction we originated before. Now, the significance of Camasilla is that that was a site where our soldiers actually went right up to it and laid the charges and blew it up. Mm -hmm. And when they blew it up, some originally were three miles away or closer, much closer, in fact. And as they blew this up, they started to go farther away because you had artillery shells and so on going six miles and beyond. You had rockets that were going beyond the six miles. And you had a soldier who had pictures and identified the fact that this was also a chemical depot. The reason why this information became public was that this soldier was invited to our hearing, had the video, had gone to the media, and was to testify on a Tuesday, on a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, after an announcement that they would, the DOD would have a, an important announcement at 12, at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, announced for the first time that our troops may have been exposed to chemicals defensive. Now, what's fascinating is that the CIA director at the time had said there was no offensive exposure to chemicals, which is a wonderful word that allows him to not be in violation technically of the law because the difference between offensive and defensive. We blew up this depot. Now, is it your testimony that there were other chemical plants, potentially, or biological plants or depots in the Kuwait theater of operation that may not have been examined? Uh, yes, but uh, let me correct it. It's, uh, this is in regards to chemical uh, in, sites only, chemical not sites. biological sites. Okay, yes. a chemical site like Camasilla. Yes. So the word is still out as to whether there's another Camasilla. Uh, I think one can draw uh, the conclusion that uh, we don't know what's there since it wasn't inspected. And uh, as in our report states that uh, we intend to uh, address this question and find out as to the reasons why. Um, who intends to, uh, to examine this question? I missed who you said. We're, we're still looking into it. It's an open question in our report that's incomplete and in, this is a different report and I, I left the language saying there's an open question. We, implying GAO, will uh, examine it because it's open. I mean, I, I didn't want, it, it may be nothing, it may be something and that's the, the Implication. Okay. Um, at this time, let me um, uh, call on Mr. Sanders. Uh, there's so much to discuss and so little time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me briefly, um, before I ask the, uh, our guests a question, let me briefly summarize something and then I would like them to respond to it. The presidential advisory committee ruled that stress is the likely cause of Persian Gulf illnesses and that chemicals uh, and other types of exposure are likely not to have caused the problem. Very briefly, let me read you very short summaries of a number of studies. Robert Haley, MD, University of Texas, quote, uh, not quote, summary. This research project that he did concluded that many veterans are suffering from three primary syndromes due to subtle brain, spinal cord, and nerve damage, but not distress. You dealt with, I know you talked to Dr. Haley. 
Mohammed Abu Donia, Duke, uh, Duke uh, pharmacologist, his summary conducted on hens concluded that pyridostigmine bromine in combination with DEET and permethrin caused neurological deficits in the test animals, which are similar to those reported by Gulf War veterans. You have talked to him as well, I believe, or at least studied his work, right? In 1995, the DOD published its own study which concludes, quote, there is a significant increase in the lethal effects in rats given pyridostigmine bromine, permethrin, and DEET simultaneously. You may have been familiar with that study as well, right? More recently, Dr. Abudonia conducted another research project, and this showed that when rats were given pyridostigmine bromine and then put in stressful conditions, which God knows is what existed in the Persian Gulf, pyridostigmine bromine was able to cross the blood-brain barrier, leading to suppressed ACHE levels. Another study conducted by Friedman, Koffer, Shemer, and others in, at the Hebrew University in Israel presents evidence that stress may make the blood-brain barrier permeable to PB. Dr. Garth Nicholson, University of Texas, conducted research which indicates that many of the symptoms of Gulf War syndrome may be caused by chronic pathogenic mycoplasma infections. Dr. Satu Somanya, who testified before this committee, sat just where you did. He writes or tells us that experimental proof and historical evidence of symptoms such as impaired concentration and memory, headache, fatigue, and depression of the workers who worked in the organophosphate industry with those considerations, I, he, consider that the illness associated with Gulf War veterans may be due to low-dose sarin exposure and intake of pyridostigmine pyr uh, and exposure to pesticides and other chemicals. And on and on and on it goes. So my first question, given what amounts to over a dozen different studies, how does the DOD, the VA, and the Presidential Advisory Committee continue to believe that stress alone is the cause of Persian Gulf illness? <laughs> That's a question we have also, and I don't think we really have an answer to why they continue to believe as they believe. Um, actually, what you're suggesting is goes to the uh, conclusion and the recommendation we have that they uh, move their research so that they are putting less emphasis on epidemiological studies and more emphasis on treatment and causes of the nature that you are suggesting. I mean, are these researchers and others, are they quacks? Are they dummies? Are they not held up in respect in the scientific community? Should we throw out all of that research? Or, or is this useful research? Well, um, I think if I can go back to um, the PACS uh, comment to our report, and also to their own report, that's one of the criteria they use uh, in selecting uh, research articles that they examine and conclude in their finding are, uh, in fact, peer review reports. And um, the list you have, uh, many of them are, in fact, uh, were pre-reviewed. And so uh, it, it does, you know, not satisfy the requirement why they were excluded. And I think uh, if you look at, um, uh, from page 44 and 45, we list uh, over a dozen and a half different articles that we cite uh, similar to what you have uh, stated. And we found uh, uh, at least there are plausible evidence that uh, suggests otherwise. I must uh, add uh, a quick comment uh, in your question, is that while we don't know the reasons why they include or exclude uh, articles, uh, it's certainly our criteria, our methodology is, is that when one draws this conclusion, are there conflicting uh, uh, data and results out there? And when we found that, we try to reserve behind it and, and examine those information, speak with uh, the authors and so on, make sure we didn't misinterpret their stuff. And, and ultimately raise the question is, when something is uncertain, we would leave that stone still assume it's unturned, okay? And, and that's the way we approach it. And maybe uh, that's why we use the word possibly open for interpretation, because uh, we uh, did not try to attempt to see why some of these um, articles were excluded. I think, thank you. I mean, sure. One of the areas of frustration, and I think you make this point in your report, is that we have lost so much time. Mm -hmm. So much time. Let me uh, mention something to you, and I, and I would appreciate uh, if you might comment. In 1993, 1993, in invited testimony before the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations of the Committee on Veterans Affairs, Dr. Claudia Miller, who's at the University of Texas, called for a specialized research facility 
an environmental medical unit in order to test scientifically whether ill Gulf War veterans were sensitive to very low levels of common chemicals, as many of them were reporting. Although congressional appropriations for half the cost of the facility were obtained through a bipartisan effort and DOD agreed to fund the remainder, DOD failed to implement the project. No such research facility currently exists that will allow physicians to diagnose or rule out chemical sensitivity in the veterans. She came forward with this proposal, which, re which received initial approval in 1993. This is 1997. We still have not even done that. Would you want to comment on that? Well, it's impossible for us to audit the or to evaluate the and know precisely the motivations of people. Uh, what we look at, and, and that's what you're telling us about, is we look at the actions and we look at the programs and we look at the results of those actions and programs. And again, when we looked at the research, we found the research was very heavily focused in a couple of areas, and there was very little research going after the kinds of things you've just been describing to us. Um, as to what the motivations were for the agencies in doing what they, were, what they did do, uh, we really can't. <laughs> attest to that. Now I'm going to ask you a really hard question. Okay. Okay? <laughs> I think one thing, and, you know, as I've said a million times, this, this chairman over here is responsible for as many of the breakthroughs as any member of Congress, and I'm delighted to serve with him. And I think what neither he or I or any other member of this committee wants to do if we come back here is two years and four years from now go over the same discussion again and beat up on the DOD and beat up on the VA and so forth and so on. Now I personally, and I speak only for myself, have reached the conclusion that for whatever reason, and we can speculate some think, for example, that there is reluctance uh, for the DOD to go forward in this area because they, in fact, administered, among other things, pyridostigmine bromide, right? And we all know that nobody ever intended to do any harm to our own people. There's no question about that. But if they are the folks who administered pyridostigmine bromide to hundreds of thousands of vets, there may in fact be consciously or unconsciously a reluctance to go forward which might suggest that that drug in combination with other uh, chemicals may have be part of the problem. Whatever the case may be, do you think, based on your analysis, that DOD and VA are in fact capable of getting to the root of the problem, capable not only of giving us an understanding of the cause of the problem, but of developing, more importantly, a treatment? One of the frustrations that many of us have had. We want treatments. We want maybe not all the treatments will work, but I have mentioned and others know of different treatments out there which might be quote unquote experimental. When I talk to, v uh, to veterans who are hurting, they say, hey, give us a shot at it. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. But why don't we have the opportunity to take advantage of those treatments? Now, I have reached the conclusion that DOD and VA, for whatever reason, are not going to be able to do the right thing. Do you want to give us your view? Do you think that they're capable? Should we continue to go forward with them or look at other agencies? Uh, we're certainly not seeing ev evidence of a nature that says that they're moving out smartly on these issues. Uh, maybe as an example in a related area, uh, there were two other reports we did as a result of this uh, mandate in the armed services legislation last year. And one of them was to look at what uh, the progress was in uh, coming up with uh, uh, vaccines or uh, anti-agents uh, uh, for future chemical and biological agents that our soldiers, sailors might encounter in the future. It's a classified report, but I'll talk about what I can in an unclassified way. Uh, basically, we looked at all of the known uh, chemical and biological agents out there by nations that are uh, held by nations that we could possibly uh, go to war with uh, or that are unfriendly with us and uh, ones not only ones that they hold but ones that they could quickly produce and we looked at where DOD was in having FDA approved drugs uh, investigational drugs and uh, only something in R&D and in the last few years, been absolutely no progress. Over a number of years, there's been no progress. Now, we made a recommendation that they move out smartly, so to speak, 
uh, and they agreed with us, but as I said, there's been no progress over the last few years. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to uh, um, stop speaking here in a moment. Let me just conclude. You have the floor. You have oh, have the floor. All right. Um, let, me, let me just say this, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, when a coach on a basketball team or a manager on a baseball team continues to produce a losing record, we can sit down and talk to the coach or the owners of the team, sit down and talk to the manager. But finally, at a certain point, you make the conclusion whether that individual is capable of doing the right thing for his team. But we are the owners of this team, and we have an obligation to tens and tens of thousands of men and women who put their lives on the line defending this country to do the right thing by them. And I have received, I have concluded, not with a great deal of happiness, that for whatever reason the VA and the DOD are not going to do the right thing. I think it is a waste of our time to keep kicking and prodding and pushing and questioning them. We can do that for the next 20 years. I think ultimately we have got to conclude that there are some serious researchers out there, some people with minimal resources who have done some uh, cutting edge work. Uh, there are perhaps institutes within our own government, such as the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, who want to go forward. I think other members of Congress share our frustration. So I would think that the best thing that we can probably do right now uh, is conclude that the DOD and the VA uh, are not going to do the right thing for whatever reason, uh, find people in government and in the private sector who can work together on an emergency basis. One of the frustrations that I've had, and I think I hear that from you as well, is there is no sense of urgency. Studies come out which indicate something, yeah, and what's the plan? Well, we'll continue to do studies. Maybe five years we'll have another study. Where does it end? Where are the, unless I am missing something, Mr. Chairman, one would have thought that after all of this time, we would be hearing reports of a dozen different treatment protocols, some of which may be working, some of which may not be working, right? That's, it seems to me what we would have been hearing if one believed that there was a sense of urgency. And I don't think the DOD or the VA uh, have that feeling. So I think we owe it to work with our colleagues uh, in the House to go outside of the DOD and the VA, develop a sense of urgency, get some funding, get some timelines to those people who are willing to look at many of the questions that the GAO uh, have asked. And I just at this point want to thank uh, all of you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chen. Um, let me uh, give a different perspective. Um, I think so far what we have been discussing may be sort of half of the pie and not the entire thing. And I, I'm sensing that a lot of criticisms we're making uh, on the health research, they are what scientists call you know, systematic, deliberate, bring the evidence forward and arrive at some conclusions. And that's a very noble approach to solve a problem. The trouble that we're seeing is that when you have multiple agents with mixes that everybody agrees, to resolve the factorial answer, what are the various combinations without knowing the dose response and all that stuff, we're saying that basically you can't take step one to two to three to four, but you may have to jump over the hoop of number three because we cannot establish cause and effect. Now, it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's the paradigm you go through to examine these things in that light. And what uh, a lot of the, the, the official agencies comment was, we have not seen evidence of this, so therefore we don't do the research. Now, there's a different side of that pie, which is pushing without much debate, is in fact, what exactly happened in that war? What are the operational uh, possibilities? The, 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 what, what is that the enemy, what the, the Iraqis, what they could have done? Could they have used uh, chemicals? Could they have used biological? Could they have? And, and it suggests something a little different. Now, one can take that and say, let's make that assumption and move ahead with research rather than re-examine you know, potential we need the existence of such things before we go and, and improve cause and effect. And, and I think uh, what, what we are hearing, myself anyway, from the veterans is saying, I was there, I saw the uh, depleted uranium being hit and burned and so on. Well, one can take that and say, well, it may be 10 cases or no case, I don't know. But why can't we just take that and fire the weapon, see if in fact the smoke can uh, 
you know, have particles like that, see if in fact there's a health effect as a result in a toxicological way. Rather than saying, well, we found only a, a handful and it's not showing up in the health status of these people right now without really due consideration on how well the protocol is in determining whether they're really sick of those things. So, so you have a sort of a mismatch that I think it's, it's very difficult to, you know, I, I don't think I, uh, the, the DOD and the VA, I think they're doing the best kind of research they can given the evidence, but I think they're using the uh, very uh, strict uh, criterion research in arriving at those conclusions. So. Uh, you, you may be right, and, and our, our concern is uh, if you can't jump these hoops, then we maybe would never get there. That's, so. that's right. And let, let me just mention something. And again, I say this as somebody who is not a scientist, and I defer to you with your scientific backgrounds. A couple of months ago, uh, sitting right up there was a gentleman named Major Donnelly from Connecticut, I think. And we heard a very sad and tragic story. And he is ill with Lou Gehrig's disease right now. And one of the things that he said which moved me is he said that his symptoms became exacerbated, if my memory is correct, when he was out jogging at a military base and they were spraying for pesticides. That was triggered. Now again, I'm not a scientist, but that does tell me something that we might want to investigate. I went home uh, and last month we had a conference in Vermont, in the state of Vermont, which we focused on Persian Gulf illness, and Bob Newman, by the way, of your staff was there, who did a wonderful job in speaking to our vets about what he knows about the problem. And I was in a room with about 15 vets in, in my small state who were hurting. And I asked them a very simple question. I said, tell me something. When you go out into unfriendly environments, do your symptoms flare up? Very simple question. I'm not a scientist. One guy said, he started laughing, because his wife was sitting next to him, and he said, yeah, whenever my wife puts on perfume, I get sick. Okay. Another guy says, yeah, I used to work in a service station. I was a mechanic. I can't work around fuel anymore. The fumes from fuel get me sick. Another guy says, I was, no offense to anybody from New Jersey, I was in New Jersey recently <laughs> around the petrochemical plants, and I got really sick when I was exposed to that. Almost everybody in the room said that their symptoms flare. And what got me and really concerns me is I'm wondering how many tens of thousands of men and women who are over there are full of these toxins right now who could at least be helped if we could say, avoid A, maybe this type of pesticide in your food may make you more ill. I don't know. But to get back to your, your point, Mr. Chen, is I think those are the questions that need to be pursued. We also learned in some of the studies that I indicated, there are at least two studies which now indicate, Dr. Haley being one, that there may be actual neurological damage. All right, now that is something that is Pretty definitive, right? If somebody has neurological damage, why aren't we testing now 10,000 people to see if there's neurological damage and if it correlates to what we call Persian Gulf illness? Mr. Chen? Well, I think the comment about that study is that uh, it's not, it's, it's a small number, uh, it's, it's not uh, generalizable and so on. And, and I thought uh, in, in when it was uh, responded that way, I thought, well, then replicate it. Exactly. If, if it's it too small be, a study, we, to do we a end up proving the case. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Uh, and in a, in a logical way of research, there is, there's a <coughs> hypothesis. And then maybe it's localized to that particular unit. And right. In fact, because of their movement, they're exposed to something entirely different. Whereas another group may have uh, totally uh, very healthy groups. And in Great Britain, I, I there was know. also another study which indicates neurological damage. Is that correct? It would seem to me, instead of criticizing... Wait, wait, wait. You asked him a question. Okay. Let's, let's you think I should give him a chance to answer the yeah, question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, why not? Someone behind me wants to answer the question. <laughs> no, 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 okay. no, you wait. I, I, uh, I, I just said that, uh, you know, uh, the idea of epi studies is really to generate new hypotheses and so on. And I, I have no doubt, uh, you know, there are limitations in a very small study that uh, you refer to. And, you know, our, our own uh, team basically say, well, uh, instead of rejecting it to want to just say, hey, uh, let's try it out somewhere else. And it may work, it may not work. Um, and that's the approach we, I think we've been taking in regards to this report. Thank you very much. I, th I thank the gentleman. Well, we're going to be coming back again. Uh, but Mr. Sanders has been an early and active um, participant in these committees and really has been an equal partner with me in this effort. Um, there's no Republican or Democrat in this, in this process. Um, and Mr. Th Sanders, thank you. And, and Mr. Allen, you have been extraordinarily patient and appreciate it very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I appreciate the chance to be here and hear what you have to say, and I'm pleased with the direction this conversation is going right now because I think we need a paradigm shift here. I mean, with so, pe so many people think about diseases or symptoms as being caused by a single agent. You, there's a virus, there's a bacterium, and it produces the same kinds of symptoms in particular people. You fight, figure out the causation, you figure out the appropriate treatment, and the treatment works for everyone. But what we have with the Gulf War syndrome, what we have with the illnesses are reported, are a wide variety, say almost 700,000 people went there. They were exposed to different chemical and biological agents at different times, and in their subsequent life, they come in contact with whether it's perfume or, or insecticide or whatever it may be, other kinds of chemicals that may set off a chain reaction. So in this case, the complicating factor, it seems to me, is that every case is somewhat different from every other case. And until we recognize that and accept it, we are going to be in trouble. And that's why I thought, Mr. Chan, uh, your suggestion for research you know, if, even if you have only a few cases, we're not looking for one common cause here. That's not what these uh, uh, studies are about. We're trying to figure out a combination of causes that may have certain kinds of effects and then get to the basic point, which is how do we help the veterans who are suffering through these illnesses. So what I'd like to do is to talk for a minute about your recommendations, uh, particularly the first two recommendations. Where do we go from here? And setting aside for a moment Mr. Sanders' suggestion that we you know, just give up on the, on the VA and, and the Department of Defense, let's look at, someone's got to do this. And, and one of your recommendations is that the uh, DOD and Veterans Affairs set up a plan for monitoring the clinical progress of Gulf War veterans. Can you take that a step further. I mean, we have hundreds of thousands of veterans out there being treated by doctors all around the country. I mean, how, how do we manage this? What's the, how, what steps would you take to implement that recommendation? Um, I think that uh, in responding to that, uh, the VA particularly thought we were asking for a much more complicated system than we were asking for. Um, but recognizing just what you said is that not all of them are being treated in either DOD or the VA. Uh, it would require that you have some system for maybe statistically sampling or uh, if you think uh, we need to get uh, larger numbers in the, um, in the group. Uh, going to all of them for periodic examinations, collecting information on how they're being treated and whether in fact they're getting better or not. And then if you had information on their symptoms and their treatment and if they're better or not, you could do then some comparison. You could uh, go into the database and pull out clusters of people that have the same symptoms, look at see if they're being treated the same way and if they're better, and you may identify uh, from that some treatment that is working better than other treatments for a certain set group of symptoms. Uh, we're, we're not asking at least initially for anything real complicated, but it would require uh, a system for doing that. It would require that we get information from each of the people who have registered, uh, maybe from their doctors, or have them fill out a form uh, periodically on what I said, their uh, follow-up on what the symptoms look like, are they better or worse, and what treatment are they getting, and then we can do some comparison, some studies. So if I understand what you're saying, you're not saying you have to look at all 700,000, but you, you try to cluster some symptoms and look at groups that have similar symptoms and then try to figure out uh, or work from that base. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Yes. Uh, right now, without the information, uh, it, it, it looks like a, a uh, sort of a randomized um, trial going out there, everybody treating everybody and not knowing any results. And some people may go off outside the system and go to private physicians for the information. The, the unit analysis is not the illness themselves, but unit analysis is the individual, okay? That's what you're looking for. And then the question is, what are the combination of illness they have? Not that 
she has headaches, and I, <clears throat> uh, in the control group, also have headaches. But she may have multiple stuff, which I don't have, but somebody else has, uh, let's say, uh, joint pains and so on. The question becomes is that, you know, if, if they're being treated symptomatically, uh, what, what is working out there? What's not working? Uh, how do we make sure that, in fact, that can be shared among others and so on? What was the right way to do that? I, I don't think we know uh, whether there's a, you know, um, if there are multiple symptoms out there and illnesses, then there's no magic bullet to, to solve these things. So, um, but if it's going on already, they're being treated, it seems like it's one way to capture the information by which one can determine are there successes that uh, would be helpful for others. I think we, we sort of started thinking rather, uh, you know, uh, not very ambitiously how this is, and uh, I must say I was uh, quite disappointed by the agency's uh, uh, disagreement with this uh, particular point. Let me turn to the second question, uh, second recommendation. You suggest we should give greater priority to research on effective treatment for ill veterans and on low-level exposures to chemicals and their interactive effects and less priority to further epidemiological studies. Well, the, can, can you talk to me a little bit about the epidemiological studies? I mean, they're designed to try to figure out causation. That's partly what we're talking about. Um, but d is it because those studies you feel have been on the wrong track? You said earlier one-third of them have been related to stress, um, which in light of everything that was going on out there, you can understand, but it does seem overweighted. Uh, what kinds of research are you recommending uh, that is different from the, the kinds of studies that have been done before and that would be focused on effective treatment for veterans and on dealing with these low-level exposure to chemicals kinds of issues? Uh, well, first, the epidemiological studies, you were asking about the problem with them, and I'm going to separate them from the stress studies. The epidemiological studies, the primary problem, because they're descriptive, trying to figure out what uh, uh, the symptoms are and figure out the causes uh, related to the exposures that the uh, soldiers and sailors and airmen, Air Force had, uh, the problem there is that the data is not accurate. Uh, the records from the Gulf on uh, who took what vaccine what and who took what drug went is um, scanty. Uh, the records about exposures is uh, scanty also. And when you try to uh, rely on memories of people who have been there and you start asking them, say, four, four years after it happened. I mean, I, I was there a month after the war, and if you asked me exactly where I was on any particular day, I'd have to go back to my diary and hope that I had noted where I was and then try to remember what I was exposed to, but I'm sure I don't know what I was exposed to. Uh, I have a, maybe a little idea, but I wouldn't even know. Uh, if there was something in the air someplace I was, other than if I had happened to be in Kuwait, which I wasn't. I was hearing people talk about how bad the air was up there when they were up there because of the oil fires. But uh, that is uh, what is, uh, in our mind, um, resulting in or going to result in um, epidemiological studies that have very little use because we'll have a lot of questions about the accuracy of the conclusions. Um, the other group was uh, the stress, and we had different, uh, looking at stress as a primary uh, focus, and we had problems with uh, other things in looking at the stress. Uh, then your uh, other issue was uh, what kind of work they What should, next? Where do we go? What kind of next? Um, I don't think we're recommending that they stop the funding of anything that's ongoing. What we're suggesting is that they shift for the future funding in this area to studies that will uh, do something like what we were describing if you're tracking the wellness or the illness of the veterans who were exposed. Uh, we could use that data and then pull out, hopefully, there will be clusters of symptoms of people that are uh, experiencing uh, better health 
than other people with the same symptoms and take a look at what kind of uh, medications, what kind of treatments they're getting. That would be one set of the studies. And the other set would be looking at and experimenting probably with animals on uh, what would be, what is the effect of some of the combinations of chemicals uh, that were being experienced by some of our people that were over in the Gulf. Um, there is the possibility of using accidental exposures uh, if, in fact, that data is available for human beings. There's always uh, the problem of that accidental exposure may not be and probably isn't exactly like the exposure that the veterans experienced and they may not have all of the combinations. So uh, animal research is probably the area that we have to move into. Just going back to your first recommendation, I mean, shouldn't we have a, a, a major outreach effort? I mean, one of the things that strikes me is when we had uh, uh, Major Donnelly in here who said, you know, I, it, it acts up when I go out and go running, and, the, and it, it was a, a base down in Texas where they had just sprayed uh, uh, for, for mosquitoes, I think he was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a lot of veterans who suffer symptoms who don't have a clue you know, what the cause is. And they might be helped by some sort of outreach effort that said, look, you, you, you were in the Gulf, a lot of people have experienced certain kinds of symptoms. Here are the kinds of things that may set off, you know, uh, that may have ill effects on you that you would never attribute to, uh, to uh, what your past exposure. But for example, you know, whether it's pesticides, whether it's perfume, whether it's something, so that some of the veterans who are out there and they may not even have gone to a doctor yet. They just know that sometimes they feel lousy and they don't know why, why they feel lousy. Uh, but it would be a way to call their attention to things in their environment that uh, might help them. I, I think the more we can do in that nature, the better. And we had some concerns, and I think we wrote about it, we did write about it in the report, that, that the registry is likely to not be complete. Uh, some of the people who are on active duty uh, might not want to register because they think that might affect their, their efficiency rating or the way they're looked upon by their superiors. And there may be other people that say, oh, I just want to do it. I'll go to my own private yeah. doctor. I don't trust whoever, uh, or it's not going to do anything for me. Uh, but Dr. Sharma, I would like to invite to uh, comment a little bit more about the research that you, we were talking yeah. about. Let me uh, first answer uh, your question about the first recommendation. Uh, we find it uh, it's quite interesting that on the one hand, uh, we hear that we really don't know what caused this illness. The purpose of the federal research, one of the uh, purpose of the federal research strategy is to identify the natural course of the disease or diseases that veterans are experiencing. Now, how do you understand the natural course of the disease? Obviously, you follow the patient over time to ascertain are they getting better or worse. Now, one can argue whether should we do it through a research project or through the treatment that they're getting. The fact of it is veterans are ill. They are receiving treatment, some of them from the uh, VA system, some of them from the federal system, I mean, DOD system. Others are going on their own. Um, that's not the issue. I mean, the issue here is that those people who are within the system, do we know, are they better or worse? And if we do monitor their clinical progress, not only we will have some clues about what made them better or not well at all, but also it will provide us some understanding of the natural course of the, uh, the natural course of the disease. I mean, over time they were exposed to, I mean, uh, during the war they were exposed to multiple agents. We will never be able to figure it out to what and at what level and for how long, but at least we can then uh, try to follow or try to understand whether they're getting better or worse. Now, as far as the, uh, your second point is concerned about the uh, type of research, 
Uh, VA in particular uh, seemed to be making a point of clinical trial, and I wanted to re-emphasize here, we are really not talking about clinical trials. We are not talking about, uh, you know, veterans are not receiving treatment that uh, are unproven therapies. They are receiving symptomatic treatment for something very specific, whether be it tension headaches or joint pains or whatever. Um, the issue here is, are those traditional proven therapies working on them? If they are not working, then that suggests something, that perhaps it is something very unique. It's not a common tension headache. Perhaps it's not a... Um, common, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gastrointestinal problem. This is something very unique. We seem to find this, you know, wall that we, you know, from the VA side, that this is the protocol, this is the only way one could study, which uh, I, you know, we, we find it very difficult. Uh, what we are proposing is something very simple, something very, you know, logical, uh, something that's not going to cost a lot of money, something that most healthcare providers should be and must be interested in finding out whether as a result of their clinical services, are people getting better? Mm -hmm. This is an issue of accountability. What are we doing? As a result of our efforts, are we being responsive to the public or not? That's a very simple issue we are addressing here in this uh, Good. Thank you very recommendation. Much. Mr. Chairman, if I have one more question. Uh, yeah. I, I just wonder if we're doing any better in Bosnia in terms of recording uh, what chemicals uh, our troops may be exposed to over there. Because, you know, though it's not the same situation, uh, it seems to me uh, something to think about, something to deal with. Um, <clears throat> we've looked at whether they're doing a better job in the m records of uh, what kind of medicines and what kind of vaccines the troops are getting in Bosnia than they did in Saudi Arabia. And it is better, but it's not good enough. And mm -hmm. um, we have a report that we put out, I believe, uh, May 16th or somewhere around that time that discusses that. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, I thank the gentleman. Um, very much for his questions. I'm trying to um, sort out a few issues and have them be part of the public record. Uh, and I, I think I'd like to go back where Mr. Sanders was uh, just a bit. In the third hearing that we had on June 25th, 1996, Dr. Stephen Joseph appeared before us. Now, he w w is now the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, which means he was in charge of health affairs. And one of the points that he made that just rings in my ear, because it seems to me if you have this philosophy, then you're, you're, you're really not going to go into a, into a certain room where you need to go into. He said, I'm quoting, now the most important thing that I really have to say about this is that the current accepted medical knowledge is that chronic symptoms or physical manifestations do not later develop among persons exposed to low levels of chemical nerve agents into, um, into did not first, uh, if they did not first exhibit acute symptoms of toxicity. Now, in your statement, you rightfully point out that the Congress that basically uh, support for some, um, excuse me, in, in your report, you point out that we didn't really look at low-level exposure to chemicals until um, 1996, when it was mandated by Congress to do that. So before then, um, there was uh, simply no work done by the DOD or VA. Now, the VA accepted the fact, wrongly, but accepted the fact that the DOD was correct when they said our troops weren't exposed to chemicals. But even if they thought they might have been exposed to low levels of chemicals, uh, it was 
the person in charge of health affairs for DOD who said that basically there is no accepted medical knowledge that chronic symptoms or physical manifestations do not later develop among persons exposed to low levels of chemical nerve agents. Now, in my work as a state legislator, one of the most active things we did in the state legislative bodies was to deal with environmental chemicals in the workplace. And we were very strict in not allowing businesses to expose their workers to low-level chemicals because we felt, uh, based on medical science, that low-level exposure over time results in serious illness. Have you all examined this issue in any uh, way? And if so, would you respond to it? Uh, we looked at, uh, first of all, the federal research protocol, and we found that indeed there were three, at least three proposals uh, that were submitted prior to 1996. Uh, but were not funded, and uh, the, the argument that was given to us at the time was because uh, obviously they were not aware of Kamasia, and since there was no exposure, what's the point in studying or funding those studies? Uh, the second thing, uh, you know, was about that the, the research evidence is not as clear-cut. Uh, if you take a look at the PAC report, the research they have cited, and the research that we have cited, we find uh, uh, we have an interesting finding. Uh, in, for whatever reason, uh, the research that we looked at, we examined, which was a peer-reviewed, uh, very clearly suggests, and, and that's based on that, we have concluded that there is substantial evidence that uh, when exposed to uh, animal exposed to low-level uh, exposure to chemicals, do, many, do exhibit symptoms that are very similar to the kinds of symptoms that Gulf War veterans are experiencing. Now, one of the criticism agency has, it, both the agencies had about this type of research after we sent them the draft, well, you can't extrapolate those results from animal to um, humans. The issue here is, you know, the symptoms are very similar, and obviously there are some ethical issues. You cannot do that kind of research on human being knowing that they have very adverse effects. So you have to follow the next best model is, can you learn something? Uh, we have some accidental exposure, and it is indeed DOD, uh, yeah. you know, had some funded. Did you look specifically at the basic uh, principle that was espoused by Mr. Joseph that said that current acceptable medical knowledge is that chronic symptoms of physical manifestations do not later develop among persons exposed to low levels of chemical nerve agents. That's the question I'm really asking. That was the guiding principle that basically uh, let the DOD say we're not going to look. If people literally weren't dying on the, on the field uh, and if, if they weren't doing that, then they weren't exposed to chemicals in any serious way. And if they were exposed to low-level chemical exposure, it's meaningless. Now, I'm just interested to know it's, if you, you got into this issue. Did you all start with the premise that low-level exposure is serious or not serious? Just enlighten me a little bit here. I think we started with the premise that nothing should be ruled out unless you had conclusive evidence that it wasn't uh, important or that it was not uh, okay. something that happened. Okay, so uh, what we have as testimony before our hearings is soldiers who said continually that alarms went off uh, detecting some level of chemical exposure. Now, um, DOD uh, will tell you that all of them all of them were false alarms. All of them. That they were all false alarms. Every one of them. The Czechs are the only ones who seem to have some credibility in terms of their detection and because of their follow-up. We had individuals who were in the Fox vehicle with the better equipment who came in and said they detected it. And DOD minimizes and totally refutes the testimony of their own soldiers who were trained. 
Now, the bottom line is the DOD has said from day one that, in essence, that if you didn't have acute symptoms, if they didn't see people drop on the, on, on the battlefield because of chemical exposure, they really weren't exposed to any serious chemical exposure because low level doesn't result in serious illness in the future. That is one hell of an assumption to make. Now, we have soldiers who come and testify that tell us why animals on the battlefield were just dead all around with no insects on them. And when we had veterans who come and testified of actually having the alarms go off, going into a bunker, uh, then being told they can come out of the bunker, they come out and there's a mist in the air, they start coughing up blood, throwing up, and except those who had the protective gear still on, and they went right back into the bunker. They're being told later by the DOD that they weren't exposed to chemicals. Um, and one of the, one of the feelings that, that I get from your report is, listen to the veterans. The veterans, as far as I'm concerned, have been uh, voices in the wilderness with no one listening. So I'd love you to just comment on that whole area. Um, we've heard some of the same stories you have. Uh, and uh, important to this area, we have a request uh, that we're looking at uh, from the House Veterans Affairs Committee uh, to look at the lost records, uh, the lost documents uh, known as NBC logs, uh, CENTCOM NBC logs. Uh, most of them are not uh, found, have not been found. Uh, we are, what we found in uh, going after that question is that the Defense Criminal Investigative Service is conducting a major investigation into the whereabouts and the handling of these logs, which it would be an important piece of what you're talking about. Yeah, my concern is that when they do their work, they'll then label it top secret. <laughs> No, I mean, I don't mean to be facetious, but this is, whenever we go down an interesting little area, then, then we aren't able to publicly pursue it. Uh, what we are doing, um, and this won't be top secret, is uh, we're looking at all of the various groups that are looking into different questions in this area, and we're going to um, fairly quickly have a matrix that is going to tell you and tell us exactly who's looking at what in this area, trying to come up with information and what they think their estimated time is for getting that information and then look at the gaps of investigations going on, which will give us a piece of information about uh, what are we trying to f figure out. It's not going to it may not answer the questions you're asking. I, one of the things that uh, I think we believe is there's going to be a lot of questions unanswered for a very long time, maybe forever, in this area. The one thing that I'm absolutely convinced of is that we are going to hold everyone accountable, including Congress and ourselves, that if some people feel that um, it's going to take so long that no one's going to care in the end and they can just outlast uh, the various investigations, uh, they're just wrong. They're just wrong. Um, Pritostigmine bromide, the PB, and you did what I usually do, since I can't say it well, I just say PB. <laughs> but this was um, to protect against uh, sarin exposure. This was, is a drug that is used for degenerative um, nerve disease. And it's not to be used in the way that the DOD used it unless they had permission from the FDA. It becomes, in es essence, because it is a drug used for another reason, a experimental drug. The, this experimental drug was, the FDA gave the DOD permission to use PB. They had only two requirements, one that they warn the soldiers that it is an experiment drug, experimental drug, which, by the way, our soldiers were ordered to take, which um, astounds me, an experimental drug in which our soldiers were ordered to take. They had one other requirement besides notifying our soldiers. They were supposed to keep records. 
did you uncover in, in your work uh, that our troops were notified or not notified? We have testimony from others that they were not notified in every instance, in most instances, and that we have testimony that they were not, uh, did, the DOD did not keep any uh, accurate records on who ended up taking this drug and who didn't. Did, did, was this something that in your work you came across and can you comment? I think we, um, we've seen reports on it. We did not uh, look into the record keeping of uh, who took... Uh, I'm not expecting that you were. This is not yes. an evaluation report. I just, right. I'm just asking if you have it. I want it to be part of the record. Yes. Um, in, in looking into that, uh, many of the veterans were not notified. Uh, we were told that the reason they weren't is we didn't want the Iraqis to know what we were protecting the troops against, what we were doing. The um, DOD basically, because they felt that low-level exposure was not harmful to chemicals, basically began new studies after Congress ordered them to in 96, and after Camasilla became public, which, by the way, they knew before it became public. I mean, this is not information that was new to them when it was new to the public. The only difference is they were forced to acknowledge it, again, because a soldier, beside his word, had a video that documented it. That's the only reason they came forward. Now, What's interesting to me is that the VA have very few people who have any expertise in chemical exposure. When we have asked the VA to produce a document of the thousands of doctors who have that expertise, practically no one showed up on that list. Now, uh, I'm, I'm interested to know if uh, you got into this area as well. Did you get into the, exp the ability of the VA to properly diagnose and treat chemical exposure? Was that an area that you looked into? No, we did not. Okay. We didn't look at that. Has any committee asked you to look into this uh, today? Um, no. Not, not that, that I'm aware yeah. of. I don't think so. The, um, there are only two countries in the world, to our knowledge, that have any expertise in chemical exposure. One of them, I believe, is Denmark, and the other, I'm certain, is Israel. Dr. Sharma, do you have any knowledge of these two countries in, the, in this uh, program? I'm aware of that both these countries do have uh, very uh, good protection, but we do not know the details. Okay. Uh, in the course of our investigation, we became aware of this issue. Uh, I would like to just uh, make a comment to your uh, statement that in VA there is no expertise. And while we did not look at the VA, but we did look at one research, which uh, actually two, two is the research by Dr. Haley and by Dr. Zamal of England. And they point out something very interesting, and that is, and this is a message that sort of has been missed in uh, critiquing these studies, that when you do a normal physical exam or medical exams, uh, you will miss the subtle signs of brain damage that these people are experiencing, which suggest that you know, when you are looking at these people, you need different types of protocols that are more sensitive to detecting these kinds of changes that we are seeing in uh, veterans. Um, I, you know, uh, again, as I can tell you, is that uh, we did not look at, but we do know from the research point of view that the existing, uh, med the, the current medical exams will not be able to see changes uh, and they will not be adequate. In the VA facility in Connecticut and in, in uh, West Haven, they changed their protocol a little earlier than some because the doctors that participate from Yale, one of them had a background in environmental health. And so they then had a, a bit more sensitivity to that issue. And that's really the only reason why one facility went forward. And now, you mentioned visiting two VA facilities where there seemed to be some expertise. Do you remember what those two facilities in your statement on chemical exposure? You were, I thought you went to two. You went to two VA facilities? 
research. No, the, the, those were two VA research centers. Okay. Uh, now, but they were not, uh, we did not look at specifically. And you went to them because, why? Um, because we wanted to see uh, what kind of research they were doing and the kinds of problems that they are experiencing. We had a protocol that we used. We wanted to talk to some of the, uh, uh, you know, the primary investigators of those large studies. Right, and so it's not your contention that this was a random, we're gonna just go and we'll, we'll pick out two VA facilities and look at the great job they're doing. These were two that were charged to get into this area. Right. Okay, I just want the record to, to show that. Right. Thank you. Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me pick up on, on the point that Chris was making, and then if you could tell us in your research whether you see this as a pattern in terms of the DOD uh, and the VA. Uh, the chairman mentioned uh, that we heard for five years that no chemicals, uh, that there was no chemical exposure in the, uh, in the theater, Persian Gulf theater. And then, in fact, it was as a result of probing from this committee, which finally got the uh, DOD to acknowledge that there was an exposure at Kamasia. And I believe uh, at one recent hearing, um, Bernard Roster, uh, who represents the DOD, freely acknowledged that there may well have been other exposures as well. And I think that's where we are right now. But the, from the very beginning, there was a reluctance, and I think fair to say a cover-up in that area, of acknowledging uh, that. Uh, the chairman just mentioned that this all took place despite the fact uh, that chemical, that alarms were going off all over the theater and the conclusion reached by the authorities that, yeah, we have highly trained technicians who are manning some of the instruments. The alarms went off, but hey, despite all of the alarms, the conclusion is there was no other additional exposure in that area. Um, we heard testimony, and I'd like you to maybe comment on this a moment ago, uh, at a recent hearing from a Dr. Teat, who is uh, a pharmacologist in Maryland, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly where, and he said that there were past studies done, in fact, by the DOD, if my memory is correct, dealing with the potentially dangerous uh, effects of pyridostigmine bromide. And he was very, very concerned about the use uh, of uh, that drug. I think the DOD official position of the VA is that based on everything that they know, uh, it will not cause a problem. Um, I was very interested, and the reason I'm asking of these things is it seems to me that there is a pattern out there, but I want you to comment on that based on, on your research. I mentioned earlier, and I want to repeat something that I thought was, was interesting. In 1995, the DOD itself did a study, DOD, Fort Detrick. Quote, this is the finding. The principal finding is there is significant increase on the lethal effects in rats given pyridostigmine, bromine, permethrin, and deep simultaneously, etc. Now, you know what was very interesting to me? When that study was commented on in the PAC final report, you know what happened to the word uh, significant? It came out, and I quote, a 1995 DOD study with rats reported that PB caused a slight increase in lethality of DEET and permethrin when compared to expected additive values. The word significant went to the word slight. We have seen uh, instances where researchers lost their jobs. I don't know that today there is a conclusion or an understanding, and I'd like you to help me on this one. We had Dr. Jonathan Tucker, PhD, served on the Presidential Advisory Committee staff as senior policy analyst responsible for investigating incidents of chemical and biological agent uh, exposures. He was summarily dismissed after aggressively attempting to understand the extent of chemical exposures. In other words, instance after instance, people come up with ideas. We have amazing things. I mean, here, one more instance, and I'd like you to comment on this. Uh, New York... Uh, Times, April 17th, 1996, headline, Chemical Mix May Be Cause of Illness in Gulf War. Researchers from two universities suggested yesterday the Gulf War Syndrome 
might have been caused by exposure to ordinary harmless doses of two or more chemicals that together might cause nerve damage. Six paragraphs down the line from the New York Times, quote, the Department of Defense said that the new report raised, quote, some interesting hypotheses, end quote, but that the department had no direct knowledge of the details of the work. A year earlier, the DOD itself had done a study which came up with almost exactly the same conclusion. Why would they not have said, gee, that's interesting. We did similar work a year ago. We got two separate studies coming up with similar conclusions. Boy, we should get going. My point, and I think the point that the chairman was making, is that it seems to us that wherever evidence comes forward that might suggest that the cause of the problem has something other to do with stress, those conclusions, that analysis is dismissed. Researchers who are working on that are given a short shrift, in some cases actually fired. Is that a kind of pattern that you detected in your study of the DOD and the VA? Uh, you want we found uh, similar kinds of experience uh, with some other studies, and I will just use one. Please. For example, uh, Dr. Duffy, who testified here, he had, his work was indeed supported by DOD. They were aware of the fact that, uh, you know, what uh, one would expect with low-level exposure to certain agents. Uh, there were some other reports that we cite. Um, they were not considered, at least uh, we have not seen that they had looked at, is the work of Hussein. There are a lot of instances where we have found that work has been published, it's, it's quite good work. Uh, uh, you know, it's the issue is the perspective. I mean, you can do 100 studies and still say questions remain and we need to do more. Right. Or in the absence of no contrary evidence, if you have few, it leads you to believe that yes, there is some suggestion that we are dealing with how much is enough or exclusion of certain types of research when it's indeed is there. Uh, and I agree with you. So the examples that I have given and the chairman has given, you have found to be uh, not untypical of the approach of the DOD and the VA. Is, is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. I, th I think um, uh, in a broader sense, um, what we have tried to do, we found often more questions are raised rather than the doors close and that we finish answering that question. Uh, the example that both you and Mr. Chairman keep bringing out about the Fox vehicle and the detection, um, and as I said, that's the other side of the pie that I don't think um, um, the, the research is being uh, looked into, but it, it, is, it, it opens more questions about one uh, the sensitivity of uh, our detection capability. If they are very highly uh, sensitive, then that means uh, for some reason uh, we adjust our equipment that way, which basically imply that we're trying to reduce the operational effectiveness of our soldiers because every time a signal is a llama sound, that means I have to put on a gear. And I've tried those things. Uh, maybe I'm a little small in stature to carry those things, but you can't even put your finger into the trigger to, to fire something. So uh, in a way, from a, an operational point of view, uh, you're defeating yourself. Right. That's the first point. Second point is even fact is set up in such a way that um, other agents may trigger such alarm. Then I think it's important for Department of Defense to investigate and find out what are the possible force alarm rate uh, that can create these things? What it implies that is that uh, the enemy can use other agents to create these things to disrupt the operation of the war and the battle itself, which is not a reasonable thing to do because that's not a very good piece of equipment. Because if every time tear gas can generate some alarm that you stop the operation, say everybody put on your suit, uh, that doesn't serve your soldier well because after a while the soldier is going to ignore those things. It's, uh, you know, so that, it, it, it sort of opened up a whole set of questions. And when you turn around, the other end is that from a doctrinal point of view, the question is, would the enemy use uh, full um, purity um, chemical against us? 
knowing that uh, one, uh, our response will be severe against them. So that question, see what I'm saying, is it opens up another set of questions. If, I mean, they would be not very intelligent to use that kind of thing against us, knowing that we would retaliate, not necessarily in kind, but in massive uh, retaliation against whatever, because uh, uh, that's our doctrine. So the next possible question is, well, if, if you are the enemy, you don't want that to happen, what would you do? Possibly reduce the purity? Well, the question becomes is, could that be a possibility? Could we, in fact, uh, design s systems whereby it can trigger our equipment but at the same time is not, uh, does not achieve the immediate acute response that one would expect so that there's no incident that trigger the entire sequence event that they don't wish on themselves. I'm talking about the enemy here. Uh, so what I'm saying is that those things you can test, you can try it out. Um, when, when we capture the equipment uh, through the UN, uh, do we look into the purity of those things and see what mixture is being used? Um, if they were destroyed, uh, why would they destroy people we have chance? Uh, and, and, and we end up with a whole trees of questions sitting there, and this is beyond the health issues. And we were stuck, to be honest with you. Um, and that's why we sort of said, okay, uh, even in looking at the, the bomb sites, the uninspected stuff, it, it doesn't quite make sense to us. We reach a certain impasse, and we sort of say, okay, um, we don't understand. Uh, we need to investigate further. Let, let me change uh, gear a little bit here and ask you uh, another uh, question. It would seem to me, uh, A, that we have a difficult problem. Uh, no question about that. Uh, solutions are not easily uh, arrived at. But it would seem to me fairly commonsensical that the VA and the DOD would be as aggressive as they could in trying to look at whatever safe, at least, treatment protocols there were out there. Mm -hmm. In other words, I talk again to the vets in the state of Vermont, and they said, you know, we're willing, you know, so long as it's not going to make us worse. We're willing to look at alternatives. We know that maybe they won't, maybe they won't cure us, but we're really hurting right now. We can't go to work. Mm. Uh, give us something. Give us an option. Maybe it fails. It seems to me, I know, that there are treatment protocols out there, and I think the VA and the DOD will tell us, well, they don't know if they're going to work, and that may be true. But don't you think we owe it at least to the vets to allow them to um, take advantage of different type of treatments and that we can learn from that. In other words, if there's a treatment out there and we send vets to it and it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Then we know it doesn't work. But doesn't that make more sense than saying, well, we don't have enough evidence yet to suggest that this could work? Am I missing something here? Or what, what, what do you think in terms of what, what I'm asking at is looking at different treatment protocols? Or is the VA and the DOD looking at alternative treatments, even if they're not 100 percent guaranteed right now? You're, looking, you're talking about human clinical trials. Yeah, right. Uh, in order to do that, you have to have a hypothesis and a, a proposed sure. treatment. And I don't think anything that's been done has gotten that far yet. Well, there has been. You see, I know. I mean, for example, uh, Dr. William Ray of the Environmental Health Center in Dallas has claimed that he has treated dozens and dozens of uh, Persian Gulf veterans. That's what he says. He says he's had some success. We know of veterans who have gone to him. Is his treatment effective or not? I don't know. But I think that we should at least try it out. The evidence is that no one gets worse as a result of his treatment. I know, because I entered into the record of one of our fa past hearings, again, Dr. Myra Shaevitz in Northampton VA Hospital based her treatment on a diagnosis of multiple chemical sensitivity. She claimed, and I read some testimony from some of the veterans themselves, they said, yeah, I underwent this treatment, I felt better. Now, in the long run, will that treatment work? I don't know. But it would seem to me that if you have even some inkling that there might be some success, Nicholson is another uh, example. Uh, why would we not go forward, so long as we knew that people were not going to become ill, obviously, unless they, uh, you know, Am I missing something this, here? This is consistent with our, our first recommendation, basically, is to find out what are the, the, the health status and whether they're improving or not. 
and in doing so, hopefully, uh, as we respond earlier, to say, let's find out are there things that appears to be working, even for let's say a small percentage of people, right. and, and examine that. Uh, and I think uh, we, we're not coming out with new hypotheses and so on, but try, try to gather the data out there first, and it might capture uh, some of those uh, cases that you mentioned in that way. Okay. Well, I, I would just conclude that line of questioning by saying, Mr. Chairman, that we owe it to the vets at this point uh, to begin to look at alternative types of treatments to mono monitor the success or failure of those treatments rather than just say, well, you know, we're not 100 percent sure that that treatment can work. We don't want to look at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to get you out in the next 15 or so minutes. I'd like to... Um, uh, ask you though, as it related to the issue of the various sites <coughs> that uh, may have had chemical or biological agents that were destroyed, uh, you mentioned that the numbers are difficult to determine of what sites were actually uh, looked at and what weren't after the war. You said some of it was classified information, so we're having a hard time sorting out the numbers. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that even if I have to have, you know, confidential briefings. But it raises the question of whether there's anything. Let me back up and say to you that one of my frustrations in this hearing is that I know of studies that were done on productive gear that are classified. I can't talk to you or publicly disclose information about uh, the um, protective gear that our soldiers use because it is classified. Is there anything in your report that would have been better had you not been limited by classification? <clears throat> by better, I mean stronger, more specific. Well, I, I think uh, what it does um, um, help in terms of uh, if it's declassified, it will allow us to tell you where those sites are. Is there anything else in your uh, report? No, oh. that, no, no, that's, that's, uh, that's okay. clear there. I yes, mean, sir. it would be yes, very sir. helpful to know that. Anything in addition to any other area that you walked down and you had to walk back or you decided you couldn't put, uh, make certain uh, points because you couldn't back it up because the information was classified? Uh, yes, I do. Pardon me? Yes. Okay, the answer is yes? Yes. Okay, I want you to say it in a full sentence. I'm sorry. No, no, yes, you, you, you do not need to apologize. You, you've no, just answered no. yes. Now I want you to tell me what, what yes means. That there are other uh, informations that uh, would make the report uh, stronger if we can uh, discuss it in an unclassified manner. Okay. <coughs> I have one other area. Uh, well, actually a few more, but in, in, this, in your report, which you you um, provide the agencies to have a response, and, and I think it's very appropriate that you did. The Department of Veterans Affairs comments to the General Accounting Office report. Uh, they respond on page six of their response. They say the VA strongly disagrees, though, with assertions contained within the GA report that the epidemiological research to date has been inappropriate and is not likely to yield definitive conclusions. That's on page, it's on page 84 of your document. It's on page six of the document they submitted to you. But on page 84 on the left, um, I'm in the, that last paragraph. Then they say the pursuit of uh, ep epidemiological research has led to some of the most important findings and conclusions regarding Persian Gulf veterans' illnesses to date. Epidemiological studies have, been sh have shown so far that one, Persian Gulf veterans have not experienced a high disease specific mortality rate in comparison to their non-deployed counterparts. Two, Persian Gulf veterans in the military have not been hospitalized more than their non-deployed counterparts. Three, based on a study of military hospitalization records, birth outcomes among spouses of Persian Gulf veterans and among female Persian Gulf veterans are no different than among their non-deployed counterparts. And then four, Persian Gulf veterans are experiencing a greater uh, prevalence uh, of self-reported symptoms. Uh, then they go on to say, were it not for these epidemiological studies, we would still lack answers to vital questions about Gulf War veterans' illnesses. I have a big question mark by that because 
it says we will still lack answers to vital questions. What, what answers do we have from, from what I just read? What answers do we have? And let me, or let me put it this way. Do you want to comment in general about this response to your report, this area here? Um, yes, we did um, general comment, and I think uh, we can answer uh, it specifically about these uh, references. Uh, one of the um, recommendations made by the President's uh, Advisory Commission is that they need to look at the population broadly to determine are their preferences, and we don't disagree with that. Um, and the idea behind those is to generate hypothesis whereby one can focus on further research, and we don't disagree with that. The problem that we find, uh, I, I think I'll just use one example of it so it's easier to discuss one's uh, uh, research rather than all four of them, and I'm sure my colleague can add more, is that uh, initial studies that was done, and, uh, and it's done peer review in a perfectly reasonable way and scientifically and so on, okay? Now, if I take myself out of that research <coughs> and ask the question, what have I gained out of this? What was done was really taking the entire 600 and some odd thousand veterans of Gulf War and compare them to a control group, which is the people who didn't go to the war. First, we don't know what kind of treatment these people have. In fact, whether they actually land on the shore or not, were they exposed to anything of these 690,000 people. The scientific paper basically recognized a couple of things. This is on mortality, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking without knowing, telling you what that is. Basically, they arrive at the fact that when we compare them, uh, there's no high significance in terms of uh, illness, I mean, uh, mortality, with the exception of after the war in terms of uh, their trip to uh, post-war problems and stress and all that. I personally, as a researcher, I look at it, and my colleague may disagree with me, that it's the paper recognized that before uh, the war began, that there's a self-selection going on. That means those who went to the war were healthier. So you start with the health measures that's higher than the other cohorts that you're comparing. And when they finish the war, they're equal. So I don't know the delta of health that begin with. Now, the authors recognize that and say this is one of the problems they had, and which is a perfectly reasonable uh, assumption. But um, when one concludes in public that there are no higher prevalence of mortality with the Gulf War veterans as a result of this paper, I think it's not quite correct to say that. Uh, an example, uh, could they have done, uh, take the control group and go through the same screening before they went to, uh, you know, even though they didn't go to Gulf War? Could we use the in the control group? Will we reduce the number? Uh, did we do a uh, pre-post? That means if they were healthy, can we compare them? There's a single treatment, which is the war, and after the war, are they much worse off? And that's another way to measure. So I think it's, it's open up to a lot of interpretations with these board things. But the idea is to generate hypotheses, and we're not quite sure what hypothesis they generate, with the exception that uh, now the mortality is uh, not any higher or significantly higher than the, uh, the, the control group. Can I comment, too? Um, it's important in each of these, and we didn't look at every single study, and we didn't evaluate every single study. In fact, uh, we were looking at whether hypotheses were generated from the study. So, But um, we did look at uh, a little bit about the, um, the uh, birth uh, outcomes among the spouses. And that population, it's kind of important to note that that population excludes the most at-risk population. It was births that were taking place in the DOD hospitals. And when uh, a, a pending birth is uh, declared at risk, they're usually sent uh, somewhere else outside of the DOD uh, general hospitals. And uh, of course, the veterans who were not still married in active duty, which would probably also include some of your highest 
uh, so, at-risk population, your illness veterans so, uh, would so, not be included. Yeah. So you responded first, Mr. Chen, to the mortality, and you're responding to the, uh, uh, the mor birth, birth defect. Birth, right. Now, there are, two, there are two really issues here. The one is that high-risk pregnancies are less likely to take place in a military hospital. Right. The second, though, is to me, veterans don't go to military hospitals as a general rule. They're veterans right. if they're if they're out. If they're out. Well, of course, uh, so I just in that say, register, you have people who are still in the service. No, but but that's yeah. the point. It's the only right. the people who are still in the service. The, right. We're talking about most who don't have access to the military hospitals. Mm -hmm. It strikes me, and this is my primary point. It strikes me that the VA's approach is to as to the cause of Gulf War illnesses, this research program is designed to find out what it isn't, not what it, the problem is. In other words, it's almost like they check off a list and say, well, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Is this a typical way to, to undergo trying to identify the... I mean, I had the general feeling to start that the DOD and the VA basically don't believe our veterans. That's the bottom line. So it's almost like they're trying to say, okay, you're wrong because it's not this, you're wrong because it's not this, and it's not this. They're not coming to say, okay, it's not this, this, and this, therefore it is this. It's almost like they're just trying to, and, I, and I'm just curious to know, is this the typical way that, that the research happens? Maybe there's... Well, the researchers uh, undoubtedly expose all of the limitations of their study if you would read the actual uh, outcome of the research. Right. Uh, you're asking what? I'm asking something a little different. If you right. don't know the answer to my question, I'm not asking yep. you to, to no, respond. No, I understand. What do they, they typically they, do that? And the, the question that, that strikes me, and I'm just interested if you had that same view, that the, the, the VA in particular basically is justifying their good work by saying, we've learned it's not this, and we've learned it's not this, and we've learned it's not this. Now, I may even question what they learned, because I don't think they learned that. But, but it's an interesting, it's not like we've learned it is this. Mm -hmm. We've learned it is that. And I'm just, uh, maybe it's in my unscientific mind, maybe I'm just simply observing something that's not all that significant. If it was, I was curious to have a response. Well, uh, if one does research uh, in this manner, um, let, let me say that uh, if you look at preference and find that no high reference, uh, preference, I'm sorry, and and conclude that it's uh, the case is closed. Yes, I agree with you, uh, because in in a way that the concept behind uh, the, the preference research is to generate new, uh, um, you know, you look at a broad population of people. If you decide it didn't happen with them, then you look at subpopulation. That's possibly the next step you take. Now. As, as I said before, when you have these steps of uh, research you go through, at some point you have to look at cause and effect and treatment, the ideologies and all that. If you stop right up front and say there's no high prevalence, then it's over. You see what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's sort of the problem because, um, uh, <laughs> you know, it won't generate new... <laughs> New, uh, Mr. Chang, assumption. Chan, you're really making a very important point, it seems to me. It, it, what I think I'm hearing you say, and I'm, it's basically what I hear you saying is that the VA is basically saying there's not a problem. Well, um, and in, in regards to these, uh, they certainly uh, have expressed to us that uh, finally this issue had been addressed in terms of birth defect and, uh, you there's know. not a problem. It, uh, there's not a problem. There's no greater mortality. There's not a well, problem. Well, I can read it uh, in, the, um, in the website. It says the, this is from uh, um, the Gulf Link, which basically said the June 12, 1997. The and, latest and, medical and, and study... Who is this? And who is writing this right now? Who is this VA from? Website. The website. Uh, it's the Mr. Roster's uh, website. Okay. Oh, DOD. DOD, yeah. DOD, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the latest medical study on birth defects among the children of veterans demonstrate that children of Gulf War veterans do not have an increased risk of birth defects. Seems like all are, are you know, okay. So, um, if you go to the second page, uh, basically said the limitation of the studies, which is what uh, uh, 
And the limitations of the study, in some cases, discredit the studies. Yeah, I think it gets to our bottom line. You don't close out possible causes and possible treatments until you're absolutely get, sure. So yeah. you would close out, well, this group of, of, of the population are not having problems. Let's look at, just as you said, let's look at the next group. Let's look at another group. But, uh, but okay. in this case here, let me add, though, that they said the limitation of this study being addressed in other research projects on reproductive health that are currently on the way. So but it, it sounds to me, yes. again, like the, the VA is using its resources to, to make studies to prove what it isn't, mm -hmm. in spite of the fact that some of their assumptions uh, call into question the validity of their report. But the whole emphasis is proving what it isn't, which then implies, well, why are we even going through this process? Instead of saying, we know that our veterans are sick, what is it? Now, um, let me just uh, ask two more points, and then unless you want to make another comment, I just... Can, can uh, I just yes, make one? Sure. I, mean, I, I can see value of this kind of a study if you have, which you may have, many of your active duty uh, people, personnel, who were in the Gulf who are worried about this possibility. So it would be research to see if, in fact, you could put that worry to rest or well, not. Well, if I, if I was a family giving birth to a child, mm -hmm. and I, either my wife or I served in the Persian Gulf, I would take no comfort whatsoever that the VA had done a study in a military hospital that showed there was no greater uh, defect rate in births given that it is military active personnel and given that in most cases the acute births mm -hmm. are not going to be done in military hospitals. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. I, I was just commenting about yeah. the value of such a study. Right. Well, <laughs> let, me, not, the, the, let me just take the last two points. Given what we have learned, the handling of this, uh, of this whole process by DOD and the VA, should we assume that if similar events occur in the future, conflicts, would our forces still be at risk the same way they are now? Do we, are there protocols in effect that you have uh, learned of that say basically in the future this won't happen? It relates to the Bosnia question that was asked by Mr. Allen, but we're, I want to ask it more generically. We're getting into classified information and uh, we have uh, recent okay. studies that we could talk when, when about. You're, when we're done with this public hearing, I'd love it if you would meet with Mr. Sanders and I just for a few minutes just to, to, to have a clear sense of of where your limits are. Uh, and finally... Uh, I can't discuss that answer in a non-classified forum. No, I, I understand. Let me just put it this way. I okay. want a more generic conversation about this issue in private. Okay. Um, let me just in, first and finally say to you, is there any question you wish we had asked, any area you wish we'd gotten into? If there is, then, then let's do it now. Let's not have you tell me afterwards, why didn't you ask this question? You asked the question, I should have had a good sense to ask and then answer it. Or, for either, or forever hold your peace. No, I'm serious about this. This is not even meant to be funny. I don't want to learn later that you wanted me to protect you by asking a question that you didn't want to voluntarily come forward with. Is there any question that I should have asked uh, in this very important hearing that we didn't ask an area that we should have gotten into? I think uh, there is uh, you know, a question that I often ask myself. Uh, okay. If I was a veteran, what does this all mean to me? Very good. I have Congress. Mr. Sharma, wants... if you were a veteran, what does this all mean to you? <laughs> it's probably the best question I've asked be... all day. I'll be very confused and disturbed. On the one hand, uh, I hear about the very people who are caring for me, uh, are giving some contradictory information. Research is not going to be conclusive. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. Uh, and I think that's an issue that's facing the veterans, and we all must try to redress that concern. Okay. Mr. Chan? Um. I, I think um, the, the, the question that concerned me is um, at one point, at what point time-wise will these things be resolved? And, and I think one of the real problems that uh, you have posed before about um, um, taking different approach to look at this problem, 
uh, and I was thinking if I'm a veteran, uh, I want to have a, a, a group that you've, you, you, you're talking about, be it VA, DOD, or anybody else you're talking about, that as a veteran, uh, if the, the credibility itself has to be based on the fact that if this group tells me that there's nothing there in this acceptable answer to me, then I think the matter would be closed. It's a very difficult thing to say, but I don't know how to say it. You said it. Okay. Um. Uh, my concern in this whole area is uh, how the military uh, personnel feel about the credibility of the organization uh, to uh, protect them, take care of them, and respond to their needs. Uh, and uh, a lot of what we're talking about here uh, looks like there hasn't been the kind of response you would expect there to be. And I think it's important that in the future, uh, starting right today, that in this kind of a situation, that there be a credible response. Okay. Ms. Sanders? Mr. Chairman, uh, just before I, uh, let me thank all of our guests for their, their testimony and their very hard work, which is, is very helpful to us. Uh, just one question, and maybe you have researched it, maybe you haven't. Uh, when I spoke to vets in the state of Vermont and Te in testimony that we have heard before this committee, we have heard from women uh, who believe that they have been made ill uh, with symptoms not dissimilar from, from their husbands as a result of sexual contact or whatever. Um, there was a case in Vermont of a woman who was jogging, I guess, five miles a day and, and, and after a while became so ill she could barely walk without help. Is that anecdotal? Is that you know, just something that happens to people, or have you, in your research, developed any patterns to suggest that women, or maybe even kids, we heard some testimony, you recall, from a woman who, uh, whose kids were ill as well. Uh, do you have any conclusions uh, on that? In this study, we did not do any original research. We looked at the research uh, that has already been published, and uh, in context of the conclusion that had been reached, in context of some other issues that were relevant. We did not uh, collect original information from veterans. Based on your review of the research, what should I tell some women in the state of Vermont who believe that they have been made ill? Is there research to suggest that that is in yes, fact the yes. case or that there is no correlation? Uh, it's quite possible. They were exposed to white, uh, you know, variety of exposure agents. We do not understand the precise mechanisms and it's quite possible that they, their symptoms might be due to those exposure. But that's, that's a question that remains unanswered like many others. Yeah. Right. Mr. Chairman, let me just uh, thank our guests very much for their efforts. Uh, I thank the gentleman. We just want to get together with you for about two minutes after the hearing in, in, a, in a room. But uh, let me just, as my closing statement, say um, that I, I, I truly appreciate the, the findings of the GAO report because it provides, really for the first time, a peer review opinion to so many concerns of the thousands of veterans and scientists who have contacted our committee or appeared before our committee. So I thank you for your work. Um, I'm sure you'll conclude that there are parts that aren't perfect. Um, I, too, found it uh, good that you made it Gulf War illnesses instead of Gulf War illness. Um, you know, and uh, um, I have some criticisms like that, but uh, for the most part, uh, you have been a very impressive panel, and you have, uh, I think, um, been extraordinarily helpful to this committee. And with that, we will uh, close this hearing.